patients. All right, we're good. All right. So we're Sorry, live. It's just a lot of moving pieces tonight. That's okay. Kind of well, we're live and online? Yep. Okay. We're still bring up our documents for our meetings. So we're going to pause the uh, the regular session. Does and everyone then... get our annual book, annual meeting book for tonight, or does anyone need those? We're going to call the meeting partner, the annual district meeting. No time seven oh two. And uh Sarah, you can you can get off your chair. Would you mind uh explaining us in the Right. Uh, we'll start off with introductions. I would ask each board member to introduce themselves. Sarah, Sarah would you mind? Sorry. Ken Arter. Jan Strands. And Gene Hassan, Superintendent. Clint Garderbrick. Brian Baumler. Chad Early. Adam Adler. All right. Uh, now we need to elect a chairman for the uh, annual meeting. I nominate Clint Garderbrick for. The chair of the meeting. Okay. Motion by Ken, second by Brian. Actually, that motion I believe would be to, if that was okay, that was just for the nomination. And now we'll have to close. There wasn't a second needed for a nomination. Right. I'll call for the nomination three, two, three times. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Oh, all right. If you want. All right. Uh, we're going to be closed nominations and cast a unanimous ballot for uh, Clint Garbrecht to chair the annual meeting. Okay. No, I need a second. Need a second? No, I'll second. Brian, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carried. Uh, reading of the minutes so annual meeting september was held on september 20th 2021 uh would anyone care for me to read those meeting minutes out loud typically that is not done i just have one correction okay. in the minutes from last year i did chair the meeting and it was indicated that i was the board president um i was not i was the board vice president and was stepping into the Board president that night. Okay. So in the first paragraph, just that little correction. Okay. Thank you. Correction noted. Chairman, I potentially uh, the minutes were uh, distributed and, uh, and corrected. I would move that we dispense with the reading of the minutes. Okay. Motion by Ken. Second. Second by Chad. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, the next portion, uh, Kim is going to present uh, using PowerPoint, uh, which follows the annual meeting, and Kim will pause when action is needed. Thanks, Kim. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Sinclair, the district accountant here. Um, I'll be walking you through the annual meeting tonight. Everyone should have a purple book uh, in their hand. The beginning of the meeting on the agenda starts with the treasurer's report. I'll be reading that. The treasurer's report can be found in page five of your booklet. It is a balance sheet, uh, a snapshot of time. So as of June 30th, this is was our balance sheet, the assets that we own minus the liabilities that we owe equals equity or our fund balance. We ended our year with a fund balance of $2.8 million. Another way to look at um, our fund balance would be the difference between revenues that we receive minus expenditures over time. So the leftover means that we had the fund balance remaining is the revenues more than expenditures over that time. Um, because the majority of our revenues do not come until more than half of our year is over, we know we need to borrow money to pay for our operating expenses. 
And there's a chart in there that shows in 2014-15, our fund balance was 556,000. And now, uh, just as I mentioned, it's up to 2.8 million. So that's important to know when we borrow money. Uh, fund balance is similar to a savings account. It allows us to borrow less. We would need about $6.5 million fund balance to not need to borrow money annually. And we're at 2.8 million. Uh, board policy states uh, there in blue on the screen that the fund balance shall be maintained at a level sufficient to minimize or avoid short-term borrowing um, for our cash flow purposes. So we're working really hard towards minimizing those borrowing. In 2022-23, we are requesting to borrow $3.7 million, the same as in the prior year. The need is based on our cash flow projections. In addition to our normal operating expenses, we also spend one-time money, such as ESSER. So we need that extra cash flow to be able to use that one-time money now before we are reimbursed back from the state. A lot of our money doesn't come until... We get some in September, and then the next money we will get until December. So there, there's a period of time with no revenue coming in. This graph here shows the blue line is if we do not borrow, short-term borrow this $3.7 million, and the purple is with. So in the months of October, November, and early December, without the cash flow borrowing, we would have a negative bank balance. So we can't have that. Um, interest rates have been very low for the past two years, and later this evening, um, I'll be asking you to approve our 22-23 borrowing. The net cost in 21-22 to the district in interest to borrow that money was $13,000, and for 2022-23, the interest rates have just uh, went up, and it has come to 146000 much higher than in the past, so that's why it's so very important the more that we can have in the fund balance, the less that we need to borrow here. So unfortunately, interest rates are rising, but hopefully on the flip side, we will have opportunities to invest money during the year and earn some earnings as well. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna stop and ask the board to take action and accept the treasurer's report as presented. I would move that we uh, accept the treasurer's report and the uh, Just the treasurer's report. And we approve the treasurer's report. I'll yeah. second. Mm -hmm. so you, so we can. Yep. Correct. Yep. Good. Motion by Ken, second by Charlie. I'm saying Charlie got in there before I had him with that talk over here. <laughs> All right. Any open discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Your none motion carried. Come on to a new business hearing on budget. Okay, so we're going to go through the budget hearing as well. You can see that on page six in your book, it, we're going to start with the management discussion and analysis. The slide here um, just highlights a few of the items that we were able to add with our general fund and equipment and building upgrades. And Dean's going to give you a focus case. So since 2017, with the passing of that first operational referendum since 15, uh, we've been able to address operational needs in our school district. Uh, these are just a few examples of some of the work that's been going on. I have a about a nine page document in front of me where we've kept track of different things that relate anywhere from flooring, roofing, uh, electrical, technology, infrastructure, equipment like floor scrubbers, scrubbers and lawnmowers, um, plow truck, turning lighting over to LED lighting, fixing boiler tubes and boilers at a middle school, diesel tank replacements at the bus garage, the list goes on and on. Those upgrades would not have been possible if that operational referendum had not passed in 2017. If you remember back to 17, we had an opportunity there as a community and the communities that make up our school district to address things ranging from transportation, technology infrastructure, operations, many of which had been deferred for years. Now, one of the pieces, and I don't want to go back too far, but 
as we are in the process right now of, of thinking back this last year and before, sometimes people will ask, why is it that we're needing a capital referendum in November? Why haven't we as a school district kept up with some of those needs? And for that, I think people need to have a little bit of a, a history background. Back in 1993, the state of Wisconsin decided to pass revenue caps. Prior to that, um, for some of you that were involved in the board actions and the school district back prior to, it was total local control, which meant school districts could identify what they felt their needs were, and then they could then levy accordingly. Now, I understand why the decisions were made. The concern was runaway taxes, and there was a feeling that that needed to be curtailed. With that stated, with the implementation of those revenue limits, school districts no longer had the opportunity up unless they went to a referendum to address some of those needs that were not within their operational capacity. Unfortunately, a trend that was seen since that time in the 90s was that many school districts, in order to make ends meet, would defer some of their maintenance. It was a way that they could make cuts as far away from the classroom as possible, make the least negative impact on student learning, and hope that somewhere in the future they would be able to address those things. And in some cases they were able to, and in some cases they were not. I bring that up because <clears throat> we are now potentially moving forward. The board has approved um, in November to have a capital referendum question posed to the communities that we serve. Now, some of the pieces that relate to that, in the last few years we have seen stable if not declining mill rate in our school district and one of the things that you need to understand that's contributing to that is the increase in valuation of property so we've been pretty conservative in our work in our forecast models thinking that you know we would put in what we would consider to be a conservative estimate on land valuation usually that's somewhere between two and four percent i'm a little bit more conservative than kim is Kim will say, well, let's look at the average of the last four or five years, and that has been somewhere between four and six percent. And I would say, okay, well, let's let's plug in three. <laughs> um, the reason I do that is because I would rather have better news to give to the taxpayer than not so good news. So one way of looking at it is valuations have increased faster than anticipated, which then means that the mill rate for our school district has gone down at a faster rate than we anticipated. There's also been work behind the scenes of the school district to pay off debt early. And again, that's only been possible because of the operational referendum support that's been provided by the communities. As this has happened, Kim's gonna walk through some of the specific numbers, but you'll see a trend that that mill rate is declining. Um, between the increase in valuation between ESSER funds coming in, these have worked together um, to contribute to that mill rate decline. Something else we want to bring to your attention is our work with Taher. This is the 11th year that we've worked with Taher Food Service Company. Um, we have been thoughtful in replacing equipment that has been needed to be replaced. We work with Jenny Fascio. In identifying those items and then replace them. In this last pan, in this pandemic, in the last couple of years that we've experienced, we've had federal meal, meal reimbursements at a higher level than we're used to, which means that we've ended up having an increase to the fund balance in our meal account. And we anticipate that that's going to be of assistance as we transition back into families paying again. One of the concerns is families have not necessarily had to have that as part of their budget and so as we transition back in we anticipate some folks are going to struggle with that and so as we do that we'll have to utilize some of that fund balance as appropriate and we'll keep you the board apprised as those things occur <clears throat> one of the things that we wanted to make you aware of is in those operational referendums we've been able to address purchases of busing um, one of the things that will happen this evening is we'll be bringing up to you the board in the, in the regular meeting. We received a donation to help us towards some of that bus purchase recently. But prior to that, we've used operational funds. In years past, before the operation referendum was passed in 2017, we were not purchasing buses at the rate that we were using them up. 
And so when we did an analysis, we had a significant number of our buses that were at end of life and being on a 45 degree curve. You want to be on a 45 so that you're having, let's say in our case, a couple buses that are stepping off from the list of options to those that are being brought on and everything in between that. 15 or so years is about the average lifespan for our buses. We quite often have an extremely effective maintenance team, and it's not uncommon that we can make them last 18, 19, 20 years. But at some point, even the sheet metal work that they do, uh, they don't pass inspection from the state patrol, and they tell us we have to take them off. So at that point, they're not roadworthy, and then we auction them and put that money towards purchasing new buses. We talked a little bit about some of the other items that have been funded. Some of the examples are up there. <clears throat> we also wanted to recognize that the information that Kim's going to share tonight is information as if the referendum is not going to pass. So it's the data that we have as of today, September 19th. So when she talks about these numbers, recognize that if that capital referendum were to pass, these numbers would need to be adjusted. Now we're putting information out and we'll continue to do so right up until November's referendum. If the referendum were to pass, it would still be a reduction in the mill rate such that a $100,000 home would see a reduction of $37 annually, meaning that mill rate is 37 cents of a thousand. It's important to note though, if that doesn't pass, and Kim, I don't have it right in front of me, but I think it's like $266. 262. 262, thank you. If the referendum doesn't pass, that mill rate will drop to the point where that same $100,000 home will receive a $262 annual reduction. So two different options. Of course, if it doesn't pass, we still have the same needs. And so the way I try to explain it from my own, let's say, personal family budget, if I'm paying off on my car and I'm doing a monthly car payment, ultimately that car payment at some point will be paid off and I won't have to put that out of my budget anymore. But if I don't do something thoughtful and I just get used to putting that money somewhere else in my family budget, at some point that car is going to be, need to be replaced. And if I haven't done something fiscally to plan for that, that can cause hardship then in the future. Kim does a nice job of, of taking pictures of things that have been replaced. So Kim, I'm going to let you talk to some of the pictures. Okay, so to highlight what you saw in the bullet points on the last screen, uh, we've taken a few pictures here in the last week or so throughout the district. So one of the things replaced was the scoreboard in the old gym at the high school. The other one had reached the end of its useful life and uh, really needed to be replaced. This here is a picture of the VEX robotics program that was added to the tech ed uh, program at the middle school we haven't had before. <coughs> And this here is the 60 ton air conditioning unit. You can see it out here behind the high school. Uh, that uh, HVAC unit is for the 400 wing at the high school. The other unit had far reached its useful life and no longer could get parts uh, to replace, uh, repair it. So we were able to have a little bit of money to replace that. Right here um, is a drill press. We actually got two new drill presses at the tech ed at the high school. Um, for their programming. I'm going to jump over here. This is our new digital PA clock uh, uh, phone system. So we did half of the project per board approval in year 21-22 and the project continues and will be completed here in 22-23. This here is called a RoboPoo. It's a food service piece of equipment and our food service staff was ecstatic, ecstatic to each get one. You put <coughs> Um, vegetables in the top and it dices them really fast and then you just take it out. So it's a, it's a, they were very happy with that. Um, this is choir attire at the high school. So in years past, a uh, student, if they joined choir, would have to buy uh, their dress or their suit for the choir. Um, now we've done this just like a band uniform. These are owned by the district. The student can use it. And then um, it's equitable, and hopefully it won't be a barrier to participate in our choir program going forward, because um, those can be used year over year. 
I'm going to skip over here to these uh, babies, the reality babies for the health program at the middle school. So now they have a, a real live baby to uh, practice on. Uh, these are the students using the bicycles for our FIAD program. Um, those bicycles were just added this year. We've been seeing them all driving almost every single day uh, with helmets. Uh, Dick's Sporting Good actually donated a bunch of items along with that program. Here's our classroom furniture at the high school. These desks um, replaced much older furniture that we had here at the district. Those desks have lifetime warranties. Um, so it'll exceed all of us here, hopefully. And uh, see, they can be used as a desk. You can make a table. You can make a pod. So they're much more versatile and can be swapped in between classroom because they're all the same. This is a warming unit at Abrams. Again, a lot of the food service equipment is aging as we go. Um, to talk a little bit more what Dean talked about, our buses are replaced at 15 years of life, or that's our replacement plan that we have now. Currently, 56% of our bus fleet is 10 years old or newer. Our vans and maintenance vehicles are replaced at 10 years of life. 90% um, of our van fleet is newer than 10 years old, which is very recent. It wasn't. Most of them were uh, very aged as in the past couple of years. So I want to point out this white maintenance truck uh, was purchased in 21-22. It replaced an old maintenance van at the end of its useful life. And a work truck was chosen because of its usefulness to the maintenance team, along with the addition of a plow. You see the plow on the front there? They can plow some or all the parking lots, dependent on the level of snowfall, reducing our snow plowing fees. Those fees average about three to four thousand dollars of snowfall. So that truck will pay for itself over time. Um, and by far, because we won't have to pay the snow plow fees. Um, this bus scratch tool, scan tool up in the corner, uh, the bus scratch mechanics did research to replace our previous tool that we had with a more cost-effective tool to be able to diagnose mechanical issues on buses and now also on the van and truck fleet, um, which we didn't have before. So that's eliminating the need to bring any of our vans or trucks to an outside dealership. So that tool will also pay for itself over time. So I gave you two examples of efficiency and cost savings for your planning. We're really trying to plan into our purchases to help maximize our general fund budget. So where we can, we try to do dual purpose um, equipment and help with that. Uh, next, I wanna talk about the emergency connectivity fund round one and two, that was a big deal in 2021-22. It was federal funding to provide tools needed to support remote learning. So we no longer are remote, we're face-to-face, -face, but remote learning includes the students bringing the device home to complete their homework. That is also considered uh, remote learning. So we learned of this funding and Corey from the technology department and I quickly pivoted to accelerate one-to-one -one device purchases we were planning to do in the next couple years. And we were able to get $325,000 worth of devices for all of the high school. Um, they actually just got, we bought them last year, but they got them the first day of school this year. And um, for the 5K and first grade, all funded. So completely free. Um, this is expect, there is expected to be a third round where we will apply for the rest of the elementary school devices um, because those would be the next ones up for replacement. Uh, this will free up our technology budget for the next two years to allow us to use on other projects in the Jenner Fund. Uh, such as that PA clock phone, that's what we're using the money for now, project um, that you have approved. And also those devices, uh, the old devices that were replaced were at the end of their useful life. Um, but we were able to sell them back to the vendor for parts for 17,000 to put back into our general fund budget. So this is just a really good story and an opportunity of funding uh, to help us in the upcoming years. All right, so next, um, we're going to move on to the budget itself. So in the booklet, page nine, is the DPI format of the budget. And it goes fund by fund. Um, so I'll explain the budget for each of the funds that you will be formally adopting in October when the levy will be set. Uh, tonight, I'm showing you the budget levy without passing the capital referendum. But in October, you will see both with and without. 
uh, for approval in the event that November capital referendum passes. Um, I do have a slide at the end that I'll give you a preview of what that looks like. Um, okay, so it starts out with revenues and taking the total revenues for the general fund. You can see in each of the slides a three-year comp comparison. And I'll show you the 22-23 budgeted column, which is the last column on each one of the slides. Fund 10 is our general fund, where the majority of our operations are budgeted. So these first two lines here, 85% um, of our revenues come from the per pupil revenue limit calculation. So this is dictated by the state. We don't uh, have any control over that other than how many students are in our district. Um, so it's a combination of state revenue limit and the amount passed in our last recurring operating referendum. And then it's broken down into two parts, uh, equalization aid, which comes from the state, and the second part is property tax. So when the majority of our funding comes just from that source. I just want to point out on the screen, do you see these blue numbers? Here there's some blue, uh, blue, blue, blue numbers. Um, the blue numbers are one-time amounts received due to the pandemic, such as ESSER. Uh, we got some additional transportation aid, some additional Medicaid uh, money, and all this came in due to the pandemic. So we're receiving these one-time dollars. Now in September, on the first day of school, we just received uh, an additional, it was called the Governor Back to School Supplement Aid. So we got another $154,000 on the first day of school, which is a I didn't have any time to put in these numbers. So it, it seems that some of our additional funding is trying to put these one-time dollars in there, but it, it's helping us now, but it's not building that revenue limit to sustain us going forward. Um, so we cannot count on those blue one-time numbers being there in the future. They're very helpful now and we're utilizing them to the best, but we don't know what the future holds. So one more thing I want to state about our revenues and how they come in is the revenue limit can be increased or decreased in the state biennial budget. We're living the second year of the state biennial budget right now. In the last one, there was no increase uh, to the revenue limit. So as you know, uh, costs are rising, but the revenue we are receiving is not keeping pace. We are receiving one-time money, which is helping, but it's not, it's like a salary increase. It's not compounding for year after year. Uh, the next biennial budget is set to be final next summer for two years. So starting 23, 24, that's the, will be the first year, but we won't know until like next August, probably uh, what the outcome is. Uh, Governor Evers has unveiled a plan for a large multi-year increase to that revenue limit, our 85%, but it has to go through the Wisconsin bill approval process and many factors can derail that plan as it had last time. So I guess we'll see what happens. Um, so at this point, when anything that you're seeing in the budget, we're budgeting that we're not gonna get any additional funding for the state because that's all we know at this point in time. Our general fund expenditures, um, I'm gonna walk you through the uses of the expenditures. The top two amounts are related to salary and benefits in the general fund and the special education fund. So uh, we have salary and benefits benefits for the general fund and then salary and benefits for the special ed fund that are supplemented from the general fund. So those numbers you've already approved in previous board meetings. And next we have open enrollment out. We do expect to see a rise in our open enrollment out numbers based on some information we received this summer. Uh, but at this point, the numbers are in final and we won't know until October 1st. Um, so when I come back in October, I'll have that number to be exact. Next is our buildings and grounds budget. It includes a base budget of $675,000, uh, which is all your things like snow plowing and all the parts and pieces they need to fix things and our uh, 
garbage removal and we have a base budget but we also have added to that budget new windows at office which the board has already approved we were going to use ESSER dollars but we're using general fund dollars and an HVAC to be purchased with the ESSER funds and we'll be bringing that HVAC plan back to you board hopefully in October um, so that we can get going and use those ESSER funds in time that's what Kim asked the question what are ESSER funds um, ESSER funds uh, stands for emergency secondary relief funds. Basically, it's kind of like the stimulus funds that you receive, one, two, and three. The school district also receive federal stimulus dollars, one, two, and three. So they're one-time money and we can use it on things. And there was a plan uh, in place uh, the board approved uh, a couple of months ago. It's from the pandemic. One, one of the final money on the feds yeah. gave because of it. Because of the pandemic. A stimulus. Yep. Uh, so that's our buildings and grounds. Next is our technology base budget of 675. Um, now, again, we freed up some money in there because we got these one to one devices we we're going to buy. So most of that budget is going to be used uh, to complete that uh, phone and clock system that we have throughout the district. Next is our transportation budget. Uh, we do expect increased costs in 22-23. So our fuel costs, as we all know, went up. In years past, an average year would have been about $120,000 in fuel, uh, diesel fuel, but now we had to budget $250,000 because the diesel fuel is at $5 a gallon. And hopefully, We'll see some sort of declines, and we have started already, but we had a budget at that $5 level because that's all we knew at the time. Our utilities. Um, utilities are also up. Our natural gas costs are at an all-time high. They're about three times what we've been paying in the past, and we really don't know what's going to happen this fall, so we're, we're budgeting a little bit on the worst-case scenario, um, but hopefully that will... Level as well. The building level budget that would be all the supplies and equipment needed and PD at each of our buildings plus athletics. Um, so we had some one time things that we bought in the past years. You saw the drill presses and the babies and the robotics. So the budget number in that line went down because we don't have those one time needs this year. Next is the curriculum budget. We are planning for two curriculum adoptions, um, but at this point in time, but we won't know if those will come to fruition later this fall, I'll know more, but at this point we're holding those budget dollars for that. Um, next is classroom furniture. I talked to you about that back in June. We have done the high school so far. The next plan uh, for replacement would be our elementaries, both of them 4K through second grade, um, but at this point, the budget place is held, and I will bring you that quote in at the November board meeting for approval. So, so at this point, it, there's a spot there, um, but I won't act on that until we go through that specifically, okay? Because that's a one kind of purchase I'd like you to look at. Next is substitutes. Our substitute cost should uh, remain relatively flat. We've approved the long-term sub already. Our Fund 46 is uh, the general fund puts money into our Fund 46 capital improvement. We've done that year over year. Now we're settling in at 200000 per year in our budget. Uh, same with Fund 73, our post-employment benefits, to make sure that going forward we have the dollars available to meet those um, needs. Next is the private school voucher um, that... Uh, it seems to be stabling out now um, that is part of our expenditures. Our property and liability insurance, we actually saw a slight decrease. I think that was the only area we had a um, slight reduction in this past year. Our library fund comes from funding as the state determines how much we spend on our library. Our rural, rural virtual academy is our online schooling program um, that was a larger cost that we had last year 
but you board took action to become a member of that consortium and now the costs have almost been in half. So that was a very good thing for us. And finally, bank interest. So as I told you earlier, our cost to borrow um, was a lot higher than we had expected. So the, the budget does not reflect what we learned about this morning. So when I come back in October, there will be an increased cost for our bank interest. Um, but hopefully some other things will level out and we can, we can make that work. Any questions on the general fund? Um, next fund is our Fund 21. It's our Veterans Memorial Scholarship Fund and Activity Fund. I'll combine one. Uh, you see that every month in your board financials, you see the balances in there. Uh, these clubs or scholarships are bringing money in and spending it out, and I make sure that they don't spend more than they have. Um, with their balance is four hundred twenty-one thousand dollars as of June thirtieth, and uh, most of the clubs have a healthy balance to do the activities they need. The next fund is Fund Twenty Seven, our Special Education Fund. So, as I said before, um, most of the revenues come from Fund Ten. Actually, sixty percent of the revenues in Fund Twenty Seven are funded from the general fund and the rest come from state aid and grants. So the state aid portion has kind of stalled out at 30% and there's a lot of talk all the time about how they would like it to be more, but 30% has seemed to be the highest reimbursement um, that we've received in time. The expenditures in the special education fund uh, the top one is salary and benefits, which you board have approved. That's our largest expenditure in there. Next is CISA aid. We approved that back in spring, and those are services they provide that we do not have staffing for. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is our alternative placement. It's a program outside of the district uh, for a few students that it's required by their IEP. So that is another significant cost for that program, and it does depend what students are in our district and what their needs are um, so that we've seen that spike a bit in the past. Finally, transportation. So any uh, driver that's driving a special ed route, any fuel or labor um, is tracked here. Um, back in 2021, you see the cost is significantly higher. We bought a special ed bus in that year. So we have two special ed buses, and two special ed bands that are designated solely to this program. Next is Fund 3839, our debt service fund. Right now, all we have left is our energy efficiency debt. You can see that on page 13 in your booklet. Um, you can see the repayment schedule that's up on your screen if you'd like to look. Um, you noticed in the year 22, 23, and 23, 24, we, don't, we are not paying any principal. And that's a function that uh, we have to pay based on the repayment schedule that was determined back in like 2012 for the state. We cannot pay this any faster. We have to follow this. It will be done in 2026, 27. A few more years to go. Uh, the next two funds, Fund 41 and Fund 46. Fund 41, it's called the Athletic Complex Thinking Fund. It's actually a fund. We put $20,000 a year in there to eventually someday resurface the track over here at the football field because uh, it will need to be done at some point. It's not there, but we have the money set aside to do so. Fund 46, as we talked about uh, quite a bit, uh, through food row management, we have been able to bring that balance, the Fund 46 balance, up to almost $3 million to use on those future capital projects. Uh, last year, this time at the annual meeting, you board approved a 10-year capital projects plan uh, that is still in place. Uh, we haven't actually used any of the money, but if we uh, would provide a recommendation to use some of the money, we would bring that to the board for approval. Um, but the money's there and no current plans for using any in expenditures. Fund 50 is our food service fund. Um, our food service is managed by Tata, a third party company. 
uh, for 22-23, all meals are based on family status of paid free and reduced, no more free meals that lasted for a two-year period. 38.6% of our students who qualify for free and reduced. Um, so like Dean said earlier, we have a transition period needed. Uh, we do not expect the same amount of revenue coming into the fund as during the free meal years. It will be a transition for families to now pay again after two years. That may present a significant financial burden to them if they've allocated those funds to use somewhere else. Um, and also we expect lower state reimbursements. If you notice in the column, our fund balance is up to 391,000. We do expect to use about 100,000 of the fund balance to 281. Um, but this year will be a very big learning year where we determine how much will groceries cost? How much labor do we need? Um, so we're gonna have to go through that, but last year we were able to save some of the money to help us through that period of time. Fund 80 is our community service fund uh, that houses our kids station program, our, which is our after school child care, fitness center, and community educations and events. So the kids station uh, last year was just shy of break even. Uh, we do have a fund balance of 136,000. So if it didn't break even, then we have some money to sustain the program until we can figure it out. But everything looks really good in this fund. So overall, uh, total expenditures is this top box here are projecting down 5%, and total levy here at the bottom. Uh, is projecting down 27 percent and that's really due to three factors um, we have long-term debt falling off we've talked about that a lot that's why we're able to go to capital referendum uh, the 2017 non-recurring operational referendum sunsetted it ended uh, so that's no longer in our levy amount and also for one year the school district received an increased state aid and that has to do with the calculation of that revenue limit of how much is state aid versus property tax. So we got some relief in there. So that's all the different funds. I'm going to give you a five-year uh, overview. I've, I've shown you this slide in the past, and it's just an update of that. This is the levy and mill rate projection before passing a capital referendum. So you see in this gray line here, this is showing for the next two years, 22, 23, and 23, 24, we will have a balanced budget. But if you notice then after that, the number starts to turn red. So red isn't good. In the year 26, 27, the number becomes large enough that if, no, if the state doesn't give us any new revenue limit funding, uh, we will need to make cuts or do something differently to be able to balance our budget. Um, so, we're really watching and doing what we can now to help us in the future year, but if nothing changes, uh, we will experience that. We're planning for no increase to the revenue limit, as we see. In the year 2324, which would be the next fiscal year, I have uh, entered in a 5% salary increase in 2324 and 2.5% each year thereafter so that was something we had talked about at one of our previous meetings and i did input that in there so you can see what that's doing to our budget it's just for planning purposes to see um, how that will look so you're assuming a cpi adjustment a couple of years ago. <laughs> like two years out um for, uh, one one year out five percent which it's more than that right now is being projected and then two and a half thereafter it's like conservative, isn't it? I just it feels conservative. I think inflation is going to hang around longer than that, but I have no idea. Yeah, so I hope, that I hope the prepared that labor costs could go up, up. So, a couple different ways that we looked at it. I, I see your point, absolutely. Um, by the same token, we're also basing this projection on a zero percent increase from the state. So, I would like to think that. We've been overly conservative with the dollars that will come in. Um, if we look at the feedback that we've gotten so far from either party, 
they're basically saying that the reason they went zero the last cycle was because they felt school districts could get by with the one-time ESSER dollars. The thought process was is now those ESSER dollars are going to go away, so they recognize that they're going to have to put something back into the system, but they're, they're being pretty tight-lipped about what that something might be. So we put zero in. If, if we use, let's just say, a, a swag of half of what the governor has proposed, these numbers would be significantly better than what we've put on here. Um, but to your point, that might get evened out because, again, if it turns out that cost of living stays up at six, seven, eight percent for multiple years, then whatever good that we were conservative on with the money coming in will most likely go out as well. You got to pay our teachers. Absolutely. Um, the green numbers, uh, the larger dollar amount would be the projected tax levy, and then the number below is the mill rates. So we've been talking about that. Um, our mill rate in 2020-21 was $10.46. Um, last year, 2021, 22, it decreased to $10.13. So remember, this is without passing a capital referendum. At this point, we've received information that the property values in our area that I will be getting the information in October will be up 15%. <coughs> that is a very large increase. So you see the dip in the mill rate. It's projecting $6.40. Um, so we have that very volatile mill rate. It goes six forty, seven fifty. Because then we go back to, we say, the property increase is only going to be 2% as what uh, Dean had mentioned earlier. The higher the property value increase, the lower our mill rate goes. Um, we are using a communication of $7.50 uh, in our communication. As you see, it's averaging around there. It likely will be less than that because we're more on the conservative side. So if we don't pass a referendum going back to that, the, mill rate would drop to the point at a hundred thousand dollar home 262 dollars and we're seeing that here but go even lower uh dependent on if all these factors come into play but it, it becomes very volatile so we haven't seen the school district mill rate be this volatile we have kept it rather steady in years past um and the district has when we have debt um, not the energy efficiency debt, but other debt in the district, we're able to pay it off faster, keeping that mill rate stable. So by paying it off faster, um, we can increase the mill rate and reduce our interest costs for future taxpayer dollars over time. So without passing a referendum, we would no longer have that option. and It would do what you're seeing here. <laughs> This next slide shows a five-year projection with passing a capital referendum. So again, everything stays the same in the general fund because all of the capital referendum would flow through our debt service fund. Um, in this case, um, our mill rate would go from 1046, 1013, and then each year it would stay stable at 975 um, because we're able to uh, schedule our debt payments to fill in that void based on um, a repayment plan. So this it would keep it much more stable. When you go to pay your property tax bill, you know what's coming. It's not going to be here one year and next year up here and then here and then here. So we really strive hard to do that, but uh, the capital referendum is key. Any questions on any of that? I, sorry to trouble you. What I can't read the red numbers here. Twenty four, twenty five. What is that number? No, I can't read this either. It's about three hundred thousand. Excuse me. Three hundred forty six thousand four hundred sixty nine dollars. So that's about the five hundred thirty thousand dollars or more. Than, not quite. The, the principal starts in, kicks in back in on your fund thirty eight. Right. right? That's yeah. Same year. Yep. So there's a, some of that is in effect impacting those red numbers those last three debt payments that we need to make on that energy efficiency so that amount of debt is just remarkable how low it is yeah it's amazing how little debt this has so we're looking at it if you think about how you have a car and then you pay off that car where we're trying to now get the next car and 
reinstate debt so that we can keep improving our district. Um, and we're seeing that in these numbers here. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, uh, I ask the board to take action and accept the budget hearing as presented. Looking for a motion. <laughs> that can come from the general. Can come from anyone. So yeah. So moved. Charlie. Second. Second. What's your name again? Belinda. Belinda. That's right. Shoot. Any other discussion? Motion on the floor from Charlie. Second by Belinda. To accept the above information shared during the hearing of the budget. All in favor? Uh, opposed? Hearing on motion carried. Uh, on the resolutions. Oh, I have one more. Oops, you have one more. Have one more. Um, there is the other post employment benefits trust report. Um, this is required by state statute for me to bring forward at the annual meeting. If we read this, our other force employment benefits trust uh, report as of June 30th, 2022, the amount in the trust at that point in time was 1,402,964. Over the course of the year, we received interest in the amount of $774, we had disbursements of $350,475, leaving a fund balance of 1,652,964. The difference between the amount in the trust, which was what was in the bank, and the fund balance was the amount that the general fund uh, transferred in July. So that will show up on our next report there. Um, you can see this in page 12 of your booklet. So our other post-employment benefit trust is no longer paying as you go. You see we have $1.6 million available. The healthy fund is allows us to cover our current retirees and new retirees that will be coming on. Um, so tonight in the regular meeting, you'll hear more about the post-employment benefit plan, how um, we're going to make it a little bit or recommend to make it more robust um, to help out the retirees and utilize this balance. So at this point, I ask the board to take action and accept the OPEP trust fund report as presented. One, one moment, one question. Yes. Um, the 774, the interest on the, on the amount of the trust. Over the course of the year, last year interest rates were down less than 0.1%. It was terrible. Uh, let's see. That's less than 1%. What did you say the break was? 0.1. 0. 0.1%. 0. So 0.001. How is that money held and what investment could it be invested in U.S. Treasuries or something instead of? That's just unbelievable. There, the, the, there was no value in that in this past year. Later tonight, we're going to talk about that. The next step to get it into treasuries or or CDs and, and things of that nature through a, a trust program. Um, that will be at the regular meeting. Thank you. Okay. Need a motion to approve the OPEB trust fund as presented? I'll um, for approval. Motion by Jan. Second. Second by Ken. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No motion carried. Is that, uh, is that all about right. Kim? Now I can. Now you can move on. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kim. Uh, move on to the uh, resolutions. It should be starting on page 14. I'll read through these. Again, we'll need a motion in a second. Anyone in the room can, can do that. So state law requires that a number of resolutions be acted upon each year at the annual school district meeting, given the Board of Education the necessary legal authority to operate the schools. These res resolutions are as follows. Uh, so the first one, school board member salaries. Um, presently, the salaries are as follows for each of the seven members of the Board of Education. $150 per each regular board meeting attended, $100 for each special meeting attended. Salary amount is prorated based on the amount of time spent at the meeting and participating as a board member. Uh, resolution, be it resolved by the electors of the school district of O'Connell Falls, O'Connell County, Wisconsin, the following yearly salaries be adopted for the members of the Board of Education. 
Section 120.10.3, Wisconsin statute. Yeah, motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve. Bruce Chet. Bruce. My Bruce. I have a second. Second. Second by Charlie. <laughs> Any discussion? Uh, the meetings that you attend through Zoom or the short as needed meetings that we've had last month because of new hires, does that follow uh, fall under the same salary? It, it, if it's a if it's a posted meeting, then it does follow that that schedule. Okay. Yep. Other. The vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Uh, number two, reimbursement of school board members. Resolution, be it resolved by the electors of the school district of Oconto Falls, Oconto County, Wisconsin, to authorize the payment of actual and necessary expenses of the school board member when traveling in the performance of duties and the reimbursement of a school board member for actual loss of earnings when duties require the school board member to be absent from regular employment. Section 120.10.4, Wisconsin statute. Um, I'll just make a comment that I don't think in the past this has ever been um, utilized, but it is one that we need to need to approve. I'll move. Motion by Jim. Second. Second by Bruce. Any discussion? We do a vote. All in favor? Say aye. aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion carried. Temporary borrowing of, by the Board of Education it is necessary to borrow funds to meet district expenses during the fiscal year as revenues such as state aid uh, and local taxes are not received until later in the fiscal year. Authorization to borrow temporarily must be granted at the annual school district meeting. Uh, resolution resolved that the Board of Education of the School District of County Falls, County, County, County Wisconsin, uh, be authorized to secure a temporary loan in accordance with the provisions of section 67.12 Wisconsin statutes for the purpose of meeting the immediate expense of maintaining the schools of the district. Motion. I'll move. Motion by Jim. Second. Second by Bruce. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? You're not motion carry. Number four, acquisition of real property. Resolution, be it resolved that the electors of the school district of Oconto Falls, Oconto County, Wisconsin, authorize the Board of Education to acquire by purchase or condemnation real property necessary for school district purposes. Be it further resolved that the conduct of the acquisition of such property be determined by said Board of Education. Section 120.10.5M, Wisconsin statute. Motion. I move for approval. Motion by Jan. I'll second. Second by Jim. Any discussion? Move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carried. Three textbooks. Resolution uh, resolved that the board of the school district of Oconto Falls, Oconto County, Wisconsin, shall be and is hereby authorized to furnish free textbooks for use in the school system and to establish a penalty for unusual or unreasonable wear according to the rules that may be established by the said board. Section 120.1015, Wisconsin statute. I'll vote. Motion by Adam. Second. Second by Chad. Discussion? How is technology affecting our need for text textbooks these days? Yeah. Well, what we see is um, a lot of textbooks are available electronically, um, but that doesn't necessarily lessen cost. Um, we find that they're often purchasing those for a period of time, and you have access to the students have access to a lot more capacity than you used to have in a in a physical text. So, a lot of our our work has transitioned into electronic, but you still, in a lot of cases, also have a hard copy for inside the classroom. Any, any thoughts to add, Heather? 
Um, I think when I look at usage around the district, I'd say that here, um, there are a number of core curriculums that you do at the secondary level that use the online, but many still use the print. Great question. Any other discussion? Well, just maybe this is too, too obvious, but I mean, is the same resolution applied to the electronic electronics that the children have? Yeah, I was wondering that same. I think there's, I think primarily there's still an expectation that we're doing everything we can to make uh, equity for students, that they have access to the materials that they need. And my, my question is, the, the resolution about textbooks, but what about the notebooks? There's a notepad, what do you call them? Is it, it, it's the same? Yeah, I think, Charlie, if I, Charlie, if I understand your point, you're probably saying, does, does this, if we are doing one-to-one, -one, do we ultimately have to modify this resolution in the future such that it says, Free textbooks and or what's the definition uh, of text yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so it so learning materials might be the future word or does something. this does this Corey, Corey, do you thought? i mean right now one of the reasons we we redid the the handbook a while back and we continue to revise that but ultimately one of the purposes in not having a charge to families is because we've seen the devices as an extension of the textbook essentially. So there is no charge for those devices at this point. So at least that's the way we've, that's kind of the angle that we've taken if, as far as that's concerned. So that makes sense. Yeah, I would just ask, I think we approve as as written and the motion that stand by Adam and Chad, but I think if we could make a note that, uh, you know, in, in the following years, we would make a modification to that such that it doesn't necessarily say textbooks, maybe it says learning materials or learning some, something that could, could uh, relate to it. That could relate I just to said we use, we use electronic textbooks, yeah. so there's a charge for those. Right. Okay, good question. Um, again, Mark and I have a second by Chad. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Hot lunch and milk program. Resolution resolved that the Board of Education of the School District of Connell Falls, Connell County, hereby directed to furnish hot lunches and milk to any and all students of this district at such places and times and at such costs as shall be set by said board. And the school board is hereby authorized to pay any deficiency which may result from said lunch and milk program. Section 120.1016 Wisconsin statute. Motion. Motion by Belinda. I have a second by Brian. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Number seven, legal proceedings. Resolve, resolution, be it resolved that the Board of Education, the School District of O'Connell Falls, O'Connell County, Wisconsin, is directed to provide for the prosecution or defense of any action or proceeding in which the district is interested for the remainder of the 2022-2023 school year. Chad, motion by Chad, second by Brian. Any questions from the discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Authorization to continue a sinking fund. Resolution, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the School District of O'Connell Falls, O'Connell uh, Falls, Wisconsin, uh, be authorized to continue to contribute to a sinking fund in the amount of $20,000 for the purchase of future outdoor facilities, uh, development, and maintenance. I'll move. Motion by Jim. One second. Second by, was that Bruce? Yeah. Any discussion? Good vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Tax levy resolution be it resolved that there shall be levied upon the taxable property of the school district of O'Connell Falls a sum of $8,161,967 for the purpose of defraying the cost of the operation and maintenance of the public schools and $49,000. $50 for debt service retirement for the school district 2021-2022. Uh, 
uh, section 120.108 Wisconsin statute. <coughs> I move. move by Charlie. Second. Was it Jim or Charlie? Was it Jim? Yeah. Who was it? Yeah. Was it Jim? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Jim and uh, it was second. Second, second, second will do Charlie. All right. All right. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Number 10, sale of unneeded school property. Resolution resolved that the Board of Education of the School District of Town of Falls, Town of County, Wisconsin, uh, authorize the sale of any property belonging to and not needed by the said for purposes, be it further resolved that the conduct of the sale of such property be determined by said Board of Education. Section 120.1012, Wisconsin statute. I'll vote. Motion by Adam. Second. Second by Chad. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Number 11, building site. Resolution resolved that the Board of Education of the School District of Colorado Falls, Colorado County, Wisconsin, uh, be authorized to designate property located to the west of Ocano Falls School on County I. That should say. Yeah. Yeah. We are modifying that. No. Where the sun comes up. <laughs> Located to the east of O'Connell Falls High School on County I. Yep, and then also that Falls? technically it's not O'Connor no, Falls. Is it still styles or is it Falls? Still styles. Still in styles. Okay. It's in the town of styles right now. That's All right. where it it. Good catch. It should be west. Yep. East. All right, so let me start this one over again <laughs> with the corrections. Uh, resolution resolved that the Board of Education of the School District of Oconto Falls, Oconto County, Wisconsin, be authorized to designate the property located to the east of Oconto Falls High School on County I in Town of Styles as a building site for a potential new middle school and or future district facilities. I will move. Motion by Brian. Second. Second by Chad. Any discussion? Corrections were noted. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. And that concludes our <coughs> resolutions. Move on to uh, section C and setting the date of the 2023 annual meeting. Right now, the potential would be uh, September 18th, 2023, at 6.30. PM. Do we need a motion for that, or is that uh, we do? Okay. I will make a motion for you, Brian. Second. Second by Chad. Set the date for September eighteenth, twenty twenty-three, at six thirty PM. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Gary, and we'll look to adjourn. Also move. I second. <laughs> Jan and Ken, with hesitation, barely. Leaving it open. <laughs> all right. And, uh, all in favor of adjournment? Aye. Uh, uh, opposed? Motion carried. And uh, don't note the time at uh, what, 8 11? 8 12. A12, all right, A12, yeah. All right, thank you, everybody. Now we'll have a real meeting. Yeah. Okay. With the conclusion of the annual meeting, we are now moving back into uh, open session for the regular meeting. Uh, Debbie, do we... Uh, yeah, let's take a. Let's say we want to take a couple minute break. Dan, let's. Uh, Come on, sit up. Five minutes. Stand up and jump.
Okay, hey everybody, I think we're going to get back uh, going, as mentioned, because we had uh, we've started the meeting prior. Uh, we're already already in open session. Um, is there anything on citizen participation? No. Oh. Noted. All right, we'll move on to the minutes of the uh, August 8th. Uh, August 22nd special meeting. So August 8th was a regular meeting. August 22nd and August 31 were a special meeting. Uh, just two things to note. Um, August 8th, I saw seven were present, but all the votes were so. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But everything carried was six old. So I don't know if there needs to be seven or not. There's one that Ken came in late on. Ken that, so that started out with good less and then it added, entered more. Yeah. I believe the voting all oh. happened prior early. early in the meeting. Because on the 22nd, then it's noted Ken showed up on the oh, that 610. Okay. So I take that back. I don't know if that just needs to be adjusted or not. I'll, I'll adjust. I'll read the end of the first. Better one that you abstain. Yep. And I was going to get to that one on the 22nd. Um, on Appendix B, it said motion carried 7 0, but I did abstain on that one due to conflict of interest. And I show that in one in my notes from that meeting. So I missed that too when I reviewed oh, it with Debbie. Thank you. Just want to call those two things out. I was just coming back. Which date was it that you uh, did the abstain? 22nd. And it would have been under um, Appendix B compensation. Yes. Yep. Yep. I've got it noted in mind. Okay. okay. So, Debbie, if you can make those corrections, please. Yes, with those corrections, are we okay to move to approve the uh, minutes? The meeting of August 8th, August 22nd, August 31st, as amended, as corrected. Motion by Ken. Second. Second by Adam. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Seven. Oh. I was swallowing water. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I hear your hurdle. <laughs> All right, financial report. Okay, take a look at your financial report. Cash on hand as of August 1st. In the amount that should say August 1st, 22. In the amount of $3,793,082. And then August receipts. In the amount of three million three hundred thirty-one thousand thirty-three dollars. A couple of August receipts I want to bring to your attention. Uh, we received the last property tax payment for the 21-22 school year in the amount of two point eight nine three million, which is approximately twenty-five percent of our funds. So I bring that up just so that people understand. We talked earlier about the need to do short-term borrowing. So when twenty-five percent of your funding arrives two to three months after the end of your school year, you can understand how that's problematic. Um, also wanted to make you aware, you see there are 127,000 in ESSER funds, and then there's that 75,000 community service project donation, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the meeting. Taking a look at the uh, August disbursements, we have Disbursements in the amount of one million five hundred ninety thousand five dollars, which left them cash on hand as of September first of five million five hundred thirty-four thousand one hundred ninety dollars. Looking into September, the September disbursements six hundred sixty-two thousand six forty-five, and the September receipts in the amount of three hundred seventeen thousand four hundred eighty-nine dollars left cash on hand then. Today, September 19th, $5,188,953. One of the things that I'll bring up is of those September receipts, part of that $317,000 is the $154,000 that Kim mentioned earlier of the one time dollars from the state. From so, the governor. Yep. From the governor. So, any questions on that first page? 
Okay, hearing none, going into the fund, uh, Fund 21, which is made up of um, starting out with the Veterans Memorial, there's $23 in interest, which left the balance of $26,959. Looking at the scholarship fund, which is also part of Fund 21, there's no change, leaving a balance of $83,981. Then the last part of Fund 21, the activity fund, so receipts of $33,941. The expenditures of 25214 and a balance of $262,661. Fund 3839, there was $46 in interest, $24,525 in expenditures, leaving a balance of $38,036. Moving over to Fund 41, there was $97 in interest leaving the balance of 114588 Capital Improvement Trust Fund, Fund 46, $2,522 in interest, and $2,985,766. And then Fund 73, Employee Benefit Trust Fund, and change in interest of $1,381, expenditures of $19,202, a balance of one million six hundred fifteen thousand seven hundred twenty dollars. One of the things that I wanted to bring up for a moment because it came up in the annual meeting, um, and Kim is actually working on this behind the scenes right now, is how can these dollars in Fund Forty Six and Fund Seventy Three potentially be invested differently? Um, there really wasn't a question prior to this because, first of all, these funds. Um, obviously have grown significantly in the last couple of years. <laughs> Over the last couple of years, interest rates have been pretty non-existent. So investing those dollars really wasn't going to get you anywhere. It was just going to reduce your capacity of it being usable. Um, now the interest rates are changing. She's already working to try to make those be competitive, try to leverage that interest. So any questions on either of those pages of fund balances? Ken, I move we accept the financial report and prove the uh, payment request in the amount of $1,290,071. We'll call vote, please. Second. Second. Second by Any discussion? Hearing none, Jan, can you do a roll call vote, please? Sure. Schindel. Yes. Baumler. Yes. Early. Yes. Carter. Yes. Adler. Yep. Strands. Yes. Garterbrek. Yes. Seven zero. Carried. Uh, under reports and discussions. Yeah. We're going to start off. Uh, Ms. Terry Olson is going to speak to the board in regards to seclusion and restraint, and also give an update on district mental health supports. Terry. Um, so every year I come to you and talk about our data regarding seclusion and restraint in the district. So that's what I'll be sharing tonight. Um, and the district report is just has to be shared with the board. There's no action. It's just information that gets put together and compiled and shared with you all. Um, I do want you to note that there is some data on the one that was shared with you that was incorrect. There's some numbers under the Abrams column that should be zeros. So if you could make a note of that in yours, I'll make sure Debbie has the um, official copy. Just when I cut and paste my report, somehow I missed um, deleting <laughs> data. Um, I did double check all the other numbers when I saw that, and the rest are all accurate. So um, just to go through the report, um, seclusion, we didn't have any incidences in the district, or this is the first year that we have to report on alternative placements. Um, that information was put into a building level, um, the building level numbers, but this year, um, DPI is asking that we um, disaggregate that out into an alternative placement. Um, so nothing is, we had, we had no seclusions um, anywhere in the district or at any of our alternative placements this year. Or, and this data is from 21 22 school year, so last school year. Um, and then when you look at restraint, um, we do have a, a situation with an alternative placement where we do have reports um, of restraint happening. Um, along with that change of reporting those numbers to the state, they also have provided um, guidance. It's not requirements at this point, but it's guidance for alternative placements that use seclusion and restraint in terms of reporting back to the district. Um, and I've been really impressed with the sites that we've used for alternative placements. With the, We're getting much more communication now. I always would request a lot of communication. I would request monthly meetings. 
um, that information is all into the guidance now um, and, and alternative placement sites um, have been have been really excellent in the last year I think in terms of giving us that communication we have I haven't had and the special ed teachers or other principals haven't had to kind of be prodding them for that information um, they're they're giving it to us much more um, readily at this point um, and then the other piece of this report is how many staff are trained in um, de-escalations uh, and um, physical restraints each year annually how many staff were trained this year um, up to this point we've had 16 staff members so for an annual year we've had 16 staff members seven teachers nine paraprofessionals trained in um, cpi is the the company that we use the training format that we use um, we're lucky that we have two staff members on site um, that do that training that not only helps bring some richness to your training but it also helps if you do have an incident in district we've got those staff members that we can rely on that are experts um, and this year with the second training we offered in August, the CPI supervisor came and actually observed one of their trainings and had excellent feedback um, for our trainers. So it was great for, you know, I felt like they'd done good trainings. I get the feedback from the people that attend the trainings, um, but it was nice to hear that kind of, you know, different perspective from, from the experts too, that our, our trainers are doing a great job. Um, and that's Lex Meislick and Sandy Partier, which you, in-house trainers. Um, again, we're going to continue. We've, we've got into a pattern of offering two training sessions per year. I, we offer it in June and August. It is a two-day training, so it's hard to do it during the school year. It's, I think we all know getting substitutes is, is, it has been pretty challenging. So we offer it in June, we offer it in August, just to give staff some, um, some options. Staff that would potentially be in a situation where they have to use seclusion or restraint, we would that's a requirement of them to attend one of those trainings. Um, so, and, and I identify those staff and the special ed teams and the, the principals also work on that. Um, I take this data and we put it into a portal that gets sent to DPI. DPI for the last couple of years has collected this data. Um, prior to that, it was just a report to the board, but now DPI is actually collecting that data. Um, so we'll get that entered in, I think December 1st is usually the deadline for that. Um, and then we continue to follow the DPI guidelines on notifying parents of seclusion and restraint, even when it's an alternative placement. Um, most of them have happened within 24 hours of it happening. So uh, and then the sites, sites that we've used this past year have been great for communicating with parents about that as well. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Terry, the intervention uh, training, is that on all or mostly elementary teachers or K-12 teachers? It's K-12. It is. Um, yep, and it's in the, the CPI training, um, it's a two-day training and about two hours of it is um, actually showing you how to do a physical hold. Um, the other, you know, 75% of it is based of, is about de-escalation. It's a great training for, you know, for life sometimes. You know, if you were to, someone comes to you with uh, kind of in an escalated state, it can give you some tools to kind of understand where someone's coming um, in their emotional state for you to kind of be able to respond appropriately. So it's a great training. Um, even though like we haven't for the last several years we haven't had much seclusion or restraint reported um, we still offer the training i think it's very important for um, special education staff especially our new staff we try to get new staff into this training to have had it at least one once um, to kind of stay current even on that and, and it's not just special ed staff it's it's open to all staff um, any staff can attend it it's a great training I had a question too on the, on the restraint. Mm -hmm. I, I apparently don't know how to read your chart, it, here, yeah. but it says there were nine incident uh, incidences reported, yeah. but uh, involving zero non-disabled and zero that should disabled. Be a zero. The nine should be a zero. That was the one of the errors that I had. Oh, okay. Yep, that nine, and then there's a two. There's a two above, above, above and that should be a zero. Of those, mm -hmm. okay. those, both of those should be zeros. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? I think so. We need an action to this or not. Just has to get recorded and okay. Okay. on the agenda. Um, so the next part I'm going to talk about really briefly um, is I've come and given a longer presentation about mental health supports in July. So I'm just following up on some of those um, just to give you some more information. Um, and I had talked before about some grant funding. So just to update you, Okano County uh, Public Health has was one of the grants that I had talked about and 
we've already purchased or are very close to purchasing um, a bullying prevention unit um, to be used at Connell Falls Elementary and Abrams Elementary. Our school counselors are going to use this unit. It's a, um, it's like a, it's, they call it a supplement to our current um, curriculum that's used in our life skills classes by the school counselors. So um, pretty excited that we can kind of, that, that our county, county public health was able to help fund that. So thank you, uh, County Public Health, um, for giving us some funds to add add some resources to our already existing programs. Um, and then the other piece of that O'Connell County grant was um, the high school is going to be doing a connectedness activity um, during kind of a couple of times during the school year. So it's going to support um, some extra time that staff need to get the materials ready to talk about, um, you know, how connected we are to students because the goal of that that activity is really to ensure that all kids have an adult at school that they can connect with um, and identify students who maybe don't have that adult and then put together some opportunities where we can make connections with kids that maybe we don't have connections already. So that grant is underway and I'm excited about that. Um, That's actually one of the areas that came up on staff survey as well. Everybody wasn't necessarily feeling that we have the type of structure in place to make sure that we are connected with all our students. Mm -hmm. yeah. on, that, on that survey and then in our interest behavior survey, that's an item that we really kind of um, make sure that we take a good look at to see, because we know that's, that's a um, pretty pretty big resiliency factor for, for kids is to be able to have one adult that they can go to um, to support them either emotionally or you know, in any other way. So. Um, the, the next source of funding that I talked about in July was the Kids Get Ahead initiative um, or grant. And um, just moving forward with that, the high school could have started attending um, a comprehensive uh, school mental health academy. Our, our first full day training is going to be next week. So we have a team of people from high school going um, and working with ASA, which is the professional organization for um, administration. And then WCAS is the professional organization for people services directors. So those two professional organizations are running this academy. Um, so pretty excited to connect with some other districts and see what they're doing in regards to comprehensive school mental health and kind of see where we're at, where we can make some improvements. Um, so that's starting next week. Um, and that grant helped fund us being able to attend that training. The other part within that kids get, a, get ahead funding Actually, grant it's funding from the state um, is about the youth mental health first aid. We've we've done a cycle, a full year cycle now, um, a year plus, a couple of months, and at this point, we've got 64 staff trained in youth mental health first aid. Um, we're going to continue to offer that training um, for sure twice in the summer to all staff, and we're also going to continue to. I'm going to see how we can offer it to staff during the school year. Again, it's a full day training, so very difficult for us to get in during the school year. Um, our PD days are full days. However, there's a lot that gets packed into those days in terms of what teachers need to do to help them help kids in the classroom. So, um, but I'm trying to work work with those schedules to see what we can do during the school year to offer it. Um, I do plan to offer it to support staff on those PD days. It's a great time for them to come in. We, we've had um, two coaches also. That's another group that we're going to be targeting over the next year is um, having as many coaches as we can um, be trained in that. Because they may, they may, a lot of our coaches are teachers, but we also know from Jerry's reports that that's kind of declining and we have other people. So that's pretty exciting too. Um, another piece that we've got put together is, um, and, and Mr. Moore helped really get this going, is um, having someone come in and do a presentation to students. Um, kind of on a topic that could relate to mental health. And we've looked at some of our, our data with cyber um, security and cyber, um, not cyber security, but like cyber use and use of media for students. Um, and so he engaged um, uh, someone from, it's a professor from UW Eau Claire who's an expert in cyber uh, bullying and a cyber, cyber bullying research. Um, so we've talked with him Dan set up a meeting between a couple of us um, administrators and we're moving forward with doing having um, Dr. Patchen, is his name, um, from UW Eau Claire. He's going to be coming in um, in the near future. I don't want, I'm not sure exactly the date it's going to be. Um, and talking with our upper elementary, it's going to be targeting upper elementary through 12th grade. Um, 
regarding focus on online safety, kindness, respect, what to do when problems occur with younger students, and then moving toward more towards um, online bullying, the impact of online bullying, and um, the, the importance of your social media or your online reputation. Um, and this links to mental health because we also know that online social media has a huge impact and can be a trigger for um, a lot of students in regards to some mental health challenges. So um, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for our kids. Um, and we're going to try to push out some resources. People services, the team is going to try to push out some resources to parents. Um, that could be too, because we weren't able to get it all in to be able to have a parent presentation, but we wanted to make sure we could get that information to our kids. That date, um, the Bellin Partnership. So that's kind of all the grants where we're at with some of the activity on the grants and funding. Um, I just just this past Friday, you know, day it is right now, it's Monday. Uh, worked with Bellin and um, some of their administration and their grant writer, and we wrote a grant, um, a three hundred thousand dollar grant, for three years to be able to get a community health worker. And I've talked. Well, this community health worker position being a partnership position. So it's really our district um, partnering with Bellin. So the funding isn't coming from, from our district. It's it's a partnership. We're just a part of programming. Um, so pretty waiting to hear back. We'll hear back, um, I think, in December if that's going to be a go. So we're hoping to have that position start this school year. Um, it may start in the spring, but it's probably more realistic than it would be for next year. And that's, that position is really helping support families through health systems, whether it's physical health, mental health. We The grant we wrote, there's a lot in regards to mental health support that this position could be offered. Um, and I know the question that Sarah had asked at the last time I spoke to this, it is a Bellin partnership, but I, I asked Bellin how that works with other health systems. And they might, you know, encourage Bellin but they work with all systems. And they would only encourage Bellin if a family was like into that system. So it's a Bellin partnership, but it's really about helping that family get any community, getting the community resources that they may need to help um, the family be more functional um, and healthy. So. Would that be a position that would be housed here in it, our district? Yeah, it would be a part-time position, 50% FTE. Um, I believe it, and then the way we wrote the grant, it would be 50% it with us and then 50 percent at the bond center so it'd be a full-time person between those two locations supporting you know families mental health um, as well as the physical health as well i have a question terry about just going back three or four paragraphs yeah and i wouldn't i wouldn't dream of asking this i guess i never thought of it if i were going to ask you so people in the district who are trained with physical first aid are they very busy but it, in talking about the mental health first aid mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of how busy those staff members are in helping kids? I don't. Okay. I don't. We're, we're working on um, using some of our, our funding to be able to get those staff lanyards so students can easily identify them, um, like identify a staff member that's been trained. Um, so we're trying to work on some of those pieces to be able to make it more visible okay. for students. So that's a good question. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then really the last piece to talk about would be um, our school-based mental health services. In the last two months, we um, have been able to bring on a second provider. We've got Bellin Health. Um, that has been an excellent um, support for a lot of our students. Um, we were at two days a week of Bellin services. During COVID, we've kind of backed down to one and a half days. And we've talked about this support. Um, Still trying to get up to, to two days this school year um, with Bellin. Um, so we're continuing to work with them. And then we've also got Oak Ridge Counseling and Consulting, which is out of Volcano Falls. Um, they're going to be adding a half a day of service in all of the buildings to start with, including Abrams. So um, Joanne and Patrice were pretty excited to be Abrams. Um, I think everyone, you know, I think I was able to share that at their opening staff in service that we'll be able to cover um, some mental health services, um, school based mental health services at Abrams. Um, and then we're going to be adding a half a day in all the buildings as we go ahead. And then if we need more um, Oak Ridge, we'll be able to help fill in some gaps there. So pretty exciting. Thank you. Any, any questions? Yeah. And I'll come back in a couple of months and we'll be talking about my RPS, Youth Risk Behavior Survey. 
So put down the results with you from last survey and then sharing the procedures on how the next survey would roll out and the timeline on that is spring in terms of when that survey's done. So we'll be back in a couple of months to talk more about buyer yes. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Moving on to the uh, district administrator's report. So the first piece is taking a look at month in review. I um, just want to give the board an update in regards to transportation. Um, as you know, you, the board, took action based on recommendation of a committee of the board that we would not provide transportation within one mile of a central location here within O'Connell Falls. I just want the board to understand at this point, we still have one route, even with that reduction. We have one of our routes that is currently not being covered. And so in order for that route to be happening on a daily basis, uh, our transportation supervisor and one of our mechanics uh, splitting that one drives in the morning, one drives in the afternoon. Um, and when possible, we're able to get somebody to sub in, but unfortunately that's only been three times so far this year. So we're continuing to look for folks that are interested in becoming bus drivers. Uh, currently we have one person that is interested in being a route driver. They're currently in training. They do not have a CDL. If we can get them to pass their CDL, then we will try to get that person into that route position that we currently have on build. We also have an individual um, that has shown interest and is in the process of joining us right now. They actually have their CDL. Um, they have an interest in being a sub driver, possibly mornings only. So we're hopeful that I'll have that person on board and trained up on the route soon. Um, we've had another individual show interest. And so we're, we're trying to contact that person. They've not responded to us. And I have another application that was just dropped off. It was yesterday. So there's some possibilities for the future, but at this point, um, it's important for everybody to understand that we greatly appreciate our transportation team, people that we have, and <coughs> retain them, while at the same time recruiting other folks. Um, in case I forget to say it later, we still need bus drivers. <laughs> so <laughs> some of the things that we've done to try to bring this out. If you look on our district webpage under the employment opportunities, we do have something on there stating that we're, we're looking for bus drivers. We have utilized um, online services to try and procure bus drivers. We have a banner out on the Warren Field fence. We've posted it on social media. We've also taken an ad out in the Times Herald. Um, we've gone to the local county fair and had a booth there to try to spur some interest so if people have other ideas if they can share that with us that would be great we continue to try to make that opportunity known to folks it is a trained opportunity so if you don't have a cdl we pay you in the process of getting your cdl there are also bonuses out there so something to think about i know some stretch for after school activities um, at this, not at, as bad. Well, not at this point, um, but throughout the year that does happen. Usually it's the most challenging in the spring because that's when we have track going on. Um, but I'm sure that that will continue to be a challenge. We do have some of our coaches that have gone so far as to get their CDL, which has been helpful. Um, I know that one of them utilized that in the football team, took a trip recently over to Marshfield. So, so for track, do you, you probably need what two buses for track? Um, so it's, quite a few. It's it's more. Uh, there'll be times where, on a given day, when we have multiple things going on in the spring, they, they might need four or five drivers. So, um, that's in the past where they've reached out to me the most is during that spring time frame. So, but there are times in the fall as well, between middle school and high school activities. So. Dean, I've had numerous people when, when the subject comes to bus drivers comes up that tell me driving the bus isn't an issue or a problem for them, it's the kids. Has there been any consideration given to maybe 
and that would require more people of putting a monitor, an adult monitor on a bus. Yeah, I mean, we've got a hard time finding employees yeah. everywhere. So yeah. I don't I don't know that that's necessarily going to help us. Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to hear me talk a little bit about a hazardous safety plan, hazardous transportation plan here a little bit. Chad's aware he helped out recently with crossing guard duties. So one of those crossing guard positions is still posted. Yeah. We, we continue to look for folks. So our young people, for the most part, make pretty good choices. And I'm stating that based on driving. Mm -hmm. um, and when they need reminders, we give them reminders. In tough situations, we've gone so far as to remove students from buses for periods of time. And obviously, that's a hardship on the family. But we try to explain to families when we're making those communications that we can't afford to lose a driver and then not be able to drive for all the kids on the bus. Um, that's, as you can imagine, that's a very uncomfortable conversation to have. Um, but it's one that we do have to be with. Uh, with uh, transportation, I know it's him come up in a couple months. Um, I, I know I'll probably make some parents upset, but we do have to make a plan to pick up kids on County I. There's two stops, one by right by the trailer park and one by the subdivision because I was talking to John Spice. Um, sometimes you have snow plows going 12, 13, 14 hours. If we have school that morning, now you got to watch for kids on County I. So, I mean, as right now, it's not a big worry, but in another couple months. So, I mean, they're, they're walking up. They're right. walking yeah. to County I. Yeah. So, yes. I mean, it, we got to try to come up with a plan to pick kids up on this county, you know. I just, I'm just worried about slippery roads, car losing control, and then we have kids. So I don't know what we can do. I mean, are they able to use the plan that was made by the city? I mean, I realize it takes a heck of a lot longer to walk down Main Street to Wisconsin and over to school, but that's the like the safe route. You have to leave ten to fifteen minutes early. I think we have an agenda item later for the. Hazardous. hazardous plans that be more appropriate at that point on the agenda i guess i mean i knew you were talking through this subject here um just want to make sure we get it in the right is it, yeah is it in the, i guess is the hazardous plan talk at all about buses or is that that's that's separate that's not really it doesn't but you you can at that point if you want we could yeah okay i think we let's let's talk about it there could. And or I, I guess to Chad's point, it's probably more so an issue as climate weather. So even if we wanted to do something in October, good and perfect for that. Okay. Um, that kind of moves into the pedestrian safety plan. By the way, in okay. case, in case I didn't, <laughs> in case I didn't remember, we, we need bus drivers. <laughs> um, so. We met as a district and city staff team um, prior to school starting to try to solidify a plan. Um, you know, it was brought up that there was a safe routes map that was put out that's actually in the process of trying to be updated right now. Um, because part of it was the use of crossing guards. And at that point, we didn't have crossing guards in some of the spots right around the Pound Falls Elementary. So, we kind of put our heads together. Kudos to the Ocon Falls Elementary staff for their efforts to identify multiple crossing guards that are along Farm Road, both at the entrance and the exit into Ocon Falls Elementary, as well as the spot where Farm Road meets Sunrise Court. Um, the city established a crossing guard position down at the intersection of Farm and Main. Um, also identified some signage 
that they're using, not just in that spot, also along Farm Road and in other places around the city. So that work continues. So I appreciated Peter Wills and Chief Olson meeting with us and the work that they're doing right now to continue trying to help us slow traffic down, not just in our direct vicinity, but throughout the city. Um, also, we had, as you can imagine, all the different activities going on at the start of the school year. So in service with new staff, in service with all of our staff, um, wanted to say a thank you, and I'm sure I'll forget some people, but all the folks, the district off staff, the admin, all the support system that goes on with onboarding all of our, our new people, uh, buildings or grounds of maintenance and all the things that they do in the course of the summer to get the schools up and ready to roll. Our, our staff that are involved as mentors and their willingness to step in and assist our, our new members. That's a that's a extremely important piece for the integration of our, our new people. So their willingness to be mentors greatly appreciated. Food service team for their support, not just during in-service, but all the time. FFA alumni who every year provides an awesome lunch for our, our new staff. It's always greatly appreciated. If you're not aware, Ken is quite the cook and he always brings some great <laughs> food. Um, the staff that are involved in the in all the summer work that they do, professional development, curriculum assessment. It's been stated here multiple times by Terry a minute ago. There's not enough resource available to do that PD during the course of the year. Um, I do recognize it's a double-edged sword. So when we look at some of that staff survey feedback, the concept of the workload increasing, that's a valid statement. I mean, over the years, summertime has become professional development for a lot of staff because we're unable to do it all during the course of the year. So we appreciate the staff's willingness to be involved in that. Um, the technology folks who are behind the scenes are making sure that all the technology is up and running, ready to go for the new year. Uh, this year was especially exceptional because we had um, new clocks and phones and all kinds of other pieces that were going into that. Um, so just a lot of moving parts that a lot of times folks don't necessarily recognize are happening for that beginning of the year to, to kick off appropriately. Um, unfortunately, then we sometimes get challenges. We had to put up communication here uh, this last week, one of our applications outside of the school district was hacked. Um, we became aware that there was some inappropriate material that had been identified by some parents. And so we shut down the seesaw. Um, when I say shut it down, that's kind of a mixed term. We did everything within our ability to um, address the issue. We reached out to our parents, made them aware. Uh, Corey was involved with you know, trying to better understand it from the national level and how that affected us here and so we're bringing that back up and he's working with our staff on that but again one of those pieces that we do a lot of proactive efforts to try and not be a victim when it relates to these types of events by the same token this is actually something that took place globally so it affected a lot of different districts who you see saw as a learning management system for the elementary levels. Um, also, past the month in review, just an update on the capital referendum. Um, we have been working together with staff from the Donovan Group as well as Nexus to improve our communications. And so we have a referendum website at this point. We have created different types of communications, working together with local media as well as social media to get that information out there. I think you recently probably received a mail, mailer in the mail. Um, we have a timeline that we are continuing to push out that communication all the way up to the vote in November, trying to make sure that people are educated as to the issues that we're experiencing and why you the board decided to move forward with capital referendum <clears throat> and making sure that that information is available to them and trying to be a little bit more thoughtful in having it not just be passive, but, but just getting it, getting it from as many people as possible. Uh, one of the things that Odebi is sharing with you the board is a timeline of all the different engagements that we have scheduled. We're trying to get out to all of the different municipalities, which is 10 different municipalities that make up our school district. Um, 
if a board member had any interest in, in joining me for that. We're also reaching out to members of the planning team so that there's multiple folks that can represent us. I think the first one actually starts tomorrow evening in Brazo. So she'll share that with you. You can take a look at it and see. Um, I would encourage you to be thoughtful if you want to come to the one that you live in. That might be of interest in encouraging you. So the slide deck, um, we finished up and we'll be using that same set of slides that kind of goes through the who, what, when, where, how of the referendum and provides pictures because we know that pictures are worth a thousand words, if not more, to help people understand you know, why we're looking at the middle school or secure interests. So that does my monthly review. The capital. Um, we have a WASB fall regional meeting taking place on August 5th in Green Bay. And that reminds me that same evening on October 5th at 6 p.m. we have an informational session at Washington Middle School in regards to the referendum. So I apologize that those two things are on the same evening, uh, but we're trying to not be in competition with sporting events and things like that. It really reduces the number of dates that are possible. The WSB fall meeting in October, if, if you're available on that fifth, let Debbie know. And one of the things that's going to happen is we're going to be doing the recognition for Mr. Ken Carter. Um, we can reach level five. So kudos to Ken for that. That means Ken has a lot of tenure as it relates to WS. <laughs> Yeah, I think that actually concludes my report, barring your questions. Debbie, when are we going to get that schedule out for different meetings? I can share it with you. I'm waiting for a couple of the places to get back to you with, if we can get on their meetings and things like that on the agenda. So if there's no date, it doesn't mean I haven't reached out to them. I just haven't heard back from them. Just get into the calendar and stuff. Perfect. Okay. I think we'll uh, move on to old business uh, donations. A couple of things I wanted to make you aware of it probably caught your attention, but mm -hmm. one of the donations is an anonymous donation. So if I spell anonymous wrong, um, an anonymous donation for seventy-five thousand dollars, and. Yeah, please don't judge us by my misspelling on it, my bad. Um, $75,000, which those $75,000 were able to be put towards a bus that we were already planning to purchase. And so those $75,000 could be then put towards something else in the district. So we greatly appreciate it. And the individual wanted to remain anonymous. I have made sure how much they realize the impact that that has for our school district. Thank them profusely on what we have. So, thank you. And, um, yeah. Fantastic. We also appreciate the 25 backpacks and supplies for kids. Absolutely. Super. Anyone? Uh, I'll move that we accept these current donations with the note that huge uh, debt of gratitude to both parties and like both are very important. Yeah. Second. Motion by Jan, second by Ken. Any any discussion? <clears throat> um, uh, great. Thank you for the donations. That's impressive. Yeah. If there's anything we can do to just raise community awareness of such a donation, I mean that's a not not of who the person is, obviously, but just I think it's a good uh, a good message to show, you know, positive uh, it's a positive thing out there in the in the community. So if there's any way whether that goes in a local newspaper or anything otherwise. <laughs> or <online. laughs> no, that's fantastic. Uh, all in favor. Aye. Uh, opposed? Carried. New business, uh, banking services proposal. Well, you just keep coming up. Uh, lots of heavy financial information tonight for you. Uh, but hopefully we can get through this. Um, I 
Uh, we're going to start out by talking about banking service proposal and part B, which on the new business is the resolution authorizing entry into an intergovernmental cooperation agreement. So um, what I'm going to talk about with covers both A and B. If you can scroll up to the top. Thank you. All right, so banking services are required to go to bid every three years. Uh, we last did it three years ago and it ends on September 30th, so that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, we sent out a bid um, to BMO, uh, which is our current provider, U.S. Bank, and Peshto National Bank. The banking agency must be large enough to collateralize our bank balance above FDIC insurance. That was a mouthful. Anyway, what that means is that um, our balance is at the, tonight you approved uh, $5 million is what our balance is, is sitting at, that if something catastrophic happened, we still have our money even though the banks failed. Um, they have to do that outside of their, bank. not a lot of banks can offer that, only larger banks really can handle that service. In the chart below, what you see are the different criteria that they were measured on based on the bid that was provided and what they could offer. Uh, BMO, who is Bank of Montreal, who is our current partner, is very trusted. We have dedicated reps that are available anytime I need them and they've been really good to work with and contact me regularly and I can uh, reach out to them. US Bank, um, has provided a bid, but has not reached out to talk to me. And the relationship was more driven on us joining this intergovernmental co-op fund. So they offer similar services to what Bank of Montreal is, but I didn't get that service field from them. So I don't, I gave them a little bit of a lower score related to that. And finally, Peshtigo National Bank uh, did not respond, but they, uh, I had called them and talked to them and they said there's certain services we were requesting that they just can't offer. They, so uh, they weren't competitive there. Uh, I will be recommending to the board that we stay with BMO for our banking services for the next three years. But in addition to this, um, adding that it's called WISC, Wisconsin Intergovernmental Co-op Fund. So currently public entities like a school district, county, cities, any government citizen uh, can join. Uh, there's currently 300 participants and that will help us invest the funds that we have. So we saw earlier we, used, we got $700 of interest on $1 million, which is terrible, right? So now is the time to uh, work forward on that. This investment allows us to keep within state statutes on security, EDs, and treasury. It would allow us to seek investments on those bank balances that we're not using uh, right now. We can, um, local financial institutions, even though they're smaller, can bid on it. Um, but it also opens up an entire investment mar market rather than one bank. So we don't just have to get CDs through BMO, we can get CDs from any bank um, that's in this platform. Uh, the WISP program has 1,000 banks and 50 securities dealers available to invest in. So tonight, I, it's twofold. I'm asking the board uh, to approve the banking service proposal and secondly, to um, authorize the resolution to join WISP. So you can see now that the item that came up in the annual meeting was very timely. <laughs> yeah. we, didn't, we didn't plan Charlie either. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the interest rates were, you know, 0.1%. It, it didn't matter what you did. You weren't going to get any money. But we also, when we borrowed money, we saw that the cost was a lot lower than we're seeing now. It, it goes, correlates to each other. Okay. Okay. So I think we need a motion on the first, the bank services proposal to stick with uh, BMO. I'm correct. With that. Motion by Ken. I'll second. Second by Brian. Any questions or discussion on that one? Is there any other local banks? I mean, you, you mentioned the backing that they need to have. It was good to see Peshtigo name in the or have the ring, even though they're not can't provide services. Is there any like a, any of any credit union or anybody else that's big enough that's local 
Um, the only one, other one may have been Associated Bank, but we've tried to bid with them in the past and they've typically declined, so I didn't um, go there again. NEW Credit Union, we do have accounts there. They handle our cash transactions because BMO, as you know, moved out of Okana Falls and kind of the closest one I think is in Howard now. Um, so we still needed a place to bring our cash to. So we are utilizing NEW Credit Union and sometimes we use have used Peshigo National to borrow money. But hopefully through this WISP program, I can encourage them to help us invest their dollars um, if they bid on it. And even maybe if they don't come in as the best bid, if they're reasonable, we could still utilize them. Okay. Any other questions? None. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, and then the second portion is the resolution authorizing entry into an intergovernmental cooperation agreement with W Wisconsin Investment Series Cooperative. I'll make that motion to authorize entry into WISC. Motion by Brian. I'll second. Second by Jan. Any questions on that topic? Does that co-op do the same thing as that? What's the state fund, the uh, local government investment fund or something? Um, the, we are also in the local government investment pool as well. It's similar. This is a larger platform where we get to, we get to choose the investment. Where the local government investment pool, the, that invests, it, right invests it. Okay. Forever. So it's giving us choice. But all the funding that we get from the state automatically goes into the local government investment pool. And those interest rates are typically higher than anything you can get at the bank sometimes. So right now it's good. approaching it was more than it was more than one and a half percent this last time. And that's where you saw the twenty five hundred dollars of interest. Awesome. Okay. So different purposes than we you we yeah. could benefit by using both. Yeah, so tonight uh, we're really asking to start joining some of these state programs to help us you know, get in with the experts that are investing dollars or, um, you know, or we're going to be talking about our other pools, employment benefit trust, investing dollars there and doing it as other school groups are doing that same thing. It's just uh, the bigger the dollars and more opportunities we have and our dollars are too small alone. Is this the organization too that offers uh, financial advice or investment advice? Um, yes, it's in conjunction with a company called PME. I don't remember what that stands for, uh, but they do give investment advice to school districts. And I already have a dedicated rep, and he's been super helpful because banking, um, I know enough just personally, but I really need that support of an expert out in the field, and it comes with with this program, so it's awesome. And that's that's not overlap with what we do for what Baird does for us. No. Um, they have like the short-term borrow. They actually spoke with each other uh, to make sure that it met the requirements, so that when and or if the referendum is passed in November, that that doesn't jeopardize that borrowing that we do. So now I have two experts that are able to confer with each other, which is very helpful because we have different needs throughout the year. And I have this one, just this one. It's it's just nice that they talk to each other. Any other questions? So a uh, motion on the floor from Brian and Jan to approve the, um, the risk uh, participation. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion <laughs> carried. Short-term borrowing. Okay, short-term borrowing. We talked about that uh, quite a bit here this evening. Um, there is a document that we just got today. Uh, the short-term borrowing is a very uh, time-induced thing. It goes up, it went out to bid last Monday, and then there's about a week period of time where people can bid on borrowing us $3.7 million. 
uh, and it closed this morning at 10 a.m. So it's very rigid, okay? And the, the times are prescribed based on when our meeting is. Um, you know, if we could have went and borrowed the money a while ago, we would have been much better off, but we were stuck with today, and unfortunately, it's, it's not the greatest news ever. Um, so last year, which our short-term debt for $3.7 million, our interest rate was, our net interest rate was 0.337%, 0.337%, okay? Um, going forward, the rate that we got this morning from the same company, Baird, who is our partner, in conjunction with BMO, they actually, they are making sure that we get the money that we need. So this is a very good service that they're providing. The rate came in at 4.03%, so a significant jump just in the last year and actually within the last two weeks. Um, there, the What Barrett is making a statement is that the market, there was a lot of interest in servicing these types of bonds, but in the last two weeks, it's all but dried up. And that's why we got one bid. Um, some other school districts have gotten more bids and we got one and we were on a larger platform to try to do that. So it's a little scary because we need this money to be able to pay our bills. But I asked specifically to Baird and BMO to make sure you bid because we need to make sure we have that money to pay that. And it turned out to be our only option. We really didn't expect that to be the case. Usually every year Oppenheimer bids as well. Um, they missed the deadline. The deadline was at 10 a.m. and they were 26 minutes late and their rate was actually better than the one that came in from Baird and BMO, but there's nothing we could do about that. Okay, if you scroll down to the second page, uh, this continuing document comes directly from PMA, our financial advisors as far as investment goes. Uh, they helped us with the short-term borrowing uh, you see that Oppenheimer actually came in at 3.79, but they were late, so we can do that. If you scroll down for comparison, they put the Cambridge School District also went to short-term borrow bids today. They got more bids, um, but that could be a function of where they're located or what their movies rating is. Um, but they, it's not significantly different than what we ended up with. If you scroll down a little further, Going forward, PMA has what's called the plan program. So school districts together combine their borrowing needs, see 37 million. So if we added our 3.7 million in there, it would have been over 40 million. And they got 2.76%. And supposedly they had the best Moody's rating that you can possibly get. And they were they got that, but that was two weeks ago. And the market has changed in the last two weeks. Uh, I would like us to be able to join this plan program, but the timing didn't work out for when we needed it. So over the next year, we, we have some work to do to get into this uh, program because obviously they can get a better rate. What, what are you going to, sorry, you, you mentioned it, but what's the reasoning with the exact timing and like us not being able to re, you know, re go out or for a bid or the 20, you know, like, hey, you're in 26 yeah. minutes late. Is it because, can you explain that a little more? Um, well, first off, the 3.7 million that we borrowed last year is due back October 1st, but we need to borrow money so that a few days later we get the new money. Yeah. So it's that's the timing there. It has to coincide with your board meeting, which is today. Um, but as far as the timing goes, when you put out any bid and you say this is the end time, you, it's not fair to the other bidders. They had said we could deny the other bid, and, but then it would have required a lot of legal assistance. And really, at this point, we, then we would have to go out to rebid. We couldn't just accept that one. We had right. to rebid, and we need the money to cover our bills. So, what if Baird and Vimo uh, said, "Well, you had your chance. Too bad, and, mm -hmm. and nothing." So that that would be an alternative. So there's a lot with that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it didn't turn out good anyway. The total cost for borrowing is $146,000 uh, for this next year. If you scroll down a little bit, they provided this chart. Just in the last year, September of 21, 
the interest rate was like zero. And they're saying the current level is 2.47. And um, we got 4%, you know, I'm saying. 0.47 on AAA or? Was... Um, I don't know where the this, it, if you scroll up a little bit, Debbie, at the top of the chart, what does it say for the AAA? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So that well one of the things this is that we've been working on for the last seven years is improving our rating because we were <coughs> in the basement because we had such a little fund balance and that fund balance is one of the key ways that that they judge a district's level of risk and so our rating has improved because our fund balance has gone from five hundred fifty thousand to two point eight million uh, but as Kim was just saying, if we can in this next year figure out a way to get together with those other districts, we'll have a higher rating and we'll also have a larger ask. It's more interesting for some of those banks that become put up. Thank you. All right, so not good news, but there is a resolution to adopt the short term borrowing. As stated, three point seven million dollars tonight, along with a, a time stamp. One of the things that Kim, you and I talked about earlier. So you're looking at a higher cost for the interest that will pay on this, but some of that will be able to defray because you'll be able to invest it at a higher interest rate as well. Right. So yeah. an example is most likely at the end of the year, it won't end up costing one hundred forty-six thousand. It might end up costing fifty or sixty thousand. Who knows? Right, and, and what I told you earlier in the annual meeting, the revenue that I projected for our interest, I didn't really put any in there. So no idea, you know, how this is ever changing. So that number will go up, but our expense will also increase. Okay. You have a motion. So that, uh, oops, I, I would make a motion. Can. Can. Second. I'll second. Second by Jan. Any other questions? So this this one will will be discussed from now through the end of the fiscal year. Year. Um, the loan money comes in early October, and we would pay it back next September. So it's one year. Uh, in the future, hopefully, we could have the shorter terms or time. We can do some different things, but the. We need a fund balance to be able to do that, and we're starting to get to that point. Okay. There are means in the foreseeable, obviously, you don't know that far out, but to try and get to the point of not needing the short term borrowing. I mean, how? We would need $6.5 million in our fund balance so that, you know, we just finally got up to $2.8 million after many years. We can look into a line of credit as opposed to this borrowing like this, that is an alternative. But the bank had told me we would have to be a little bit closer to that $2 million range uh, would be a better fit. And then we could borrow just for a day at a time as opposed to a year at a time. So there's uh, that's gonna be kind of my next focus on that. It, the interest in the past was so low and now we're moving out of that. And it hurts a lot more. But at one yeah. point in time, it was this high. I mean, yeah, we borrowed. So, yeah, yeah. So oh. it's gone down. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's, there's some quite there's, a bit. Four point nine. I thought I was there's, there's, there's some provision too in how the Goofy State sets up our accounts or our accounting that if we it has it, if we move uh, money into our fund balance, some somehow we we lose it. Yeah. We lose. Yeah. Well, it has been brought up at the state level to start addressing the payments. Yeah. Because we just talked about, as part of the financial report tonight, 25% of the state's funding came into us two and a half months after the end of the last cycle. Yeah. Well, that's the end of the cycle. You actually needed it in the first quarter. That, that graph that Kim showed you shows that November, December is when that big dip is. So you actually needed it. 10 or 11 months sooner than what you, than what you received it. 
So this has been brought up at the state. Unfortunately, it hasn't gone anywhere because you can imagine the state gets to use that for 11 months. So, but that's something we continue to try to focus on. It's really sticker shock, but ultimately we need it. Yeah. You can't operate in there. So. Yeah. I mean, but it's, because of that, whatever provision that is, you have to do it slowly. I mean, you can't put a big sludge money in. Well, and as Adam brought up, <coughs> we're making improvement. When I yeah. first came here, it was 4.7, and it went up to 4.9, and now it's been going down multiple years. Yeah, and after we get through the one time funding of these ESSER funds, because we might spend the funds, but we won't get it back till later, you know, that's helping us keep that 3.7 million a little higher. Maybe we could have went lower. We didn't have the need to spend that, and they're not too fast at getting us that money back either. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Okay. The vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. And Clint, would you please note for us what the time is, and I'll report it yeah. for this motion. It's uh, 9 25. Thank you. All right, uh, resolution authorizing adoption of the Wisconsin OPEB Trust Fund and Custody Agreement and appointing a trustee. Okay, um, so there's two parts to this request also. The first part is going to talk about letters D and E on the agenda. There's two resolutions one, um, two resolution to adopt the custody agreement and appoint a trustee, and the second one. It's an investment advisory agreement and appointing the investment managers. The two are related, one and the same. So this is kind of the trend of the evening um, here tonight to ask the board to join the Wisconsin OPEB Trust. Um, I had provided in the document that you had the memo provided by uh, the legal counsel from the OPEB Trust and their website. It's managed through CESA 6. Um, so the benefits of joining the OPEP Trust. If we join that, again, it's a consortium of schools like ours that have those retirement dollars set aside. Being a member of the trust allows the district to better meet the state statutes. There's lots of rules and regulations around that right now. The money in the trust is sitting in BMO, but BMO isn't the expert at OPEP Trust related things. Um, next, we can invest the funds for our risk tolerance. They have a lot more investment opportunities within this OPEP trust, all the way from ultra conservative to a lot more risky than the CDs and treasuries. And obviously, we will probably be bringing that back to you to decide what risk tolerance we're willing to accept. Um, but right now, it's just about joining. Uh, next, we also would get access to legal counsel and investment advisors. It comes with in the plan and they are uh, experts at anything Wisconsin OPEP, other post-employment benefits. Uh, next, assistance with our annual reporting requirements. And there is a fee associated with this that we're currently not paying. The fee is based on the amount that's located in the trust at 38 basis points, which at our current level would be $1,700 a quarter. It would also help us look at how much investment we need to be fully funded uh, to fund our OPEB liability. So maybe we're putting too much or not enough from our general fund in there. And they, they help with all that. Um, so that is just joining the trust. And then uh, we would put the money in there later. And there's two resolutions. Do you have any questions? So the difference between the, the two is just one for BMO and then the other one PMA? Is that yes. the... Yep, BMO would be the trustee and PMA would be the investment advisor and they both need a separate resolution according to the legal counsel at the OPEP Trust. Okay, got it. All right, so we need a motion for appointing the trustee on the BMO Harris side. So this would strictly uh, involve our post employee benefits. Yes, uh, fund 73. It still will remain in fund 73. It's just moving it out of BMO and into the OPEP trust, which is BMO. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, it's BMO 
we're free in our own way, right? BMO kind of follows BMO, yeah. and then BMO yeah. trusts BMO. I, I was moved to to approve the resolution to adopt the trust. Motion by Ken. Second. I guess and appoint the trustee, right? Yeah. Second by Adam. <coughs> trustee and the investment manager. Okay. Does everyone understand the motion? Any other questions? I think the investment manager is that the second motion. Yes, two motions needed. So this is the first, first one. Is yeah. 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 This is just letter to the yeah. first one that you just made. It's just letter D only, okay. which is the vehicle yeah. trust. Letter D. Yeah. That's okay. Motion by Ken and Adam. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. So then we have the second portion, which is the resolution authorizing adoption of the Wisconsin Open Trust Investment Advisory Agreement and appointing the investment manager. Investment manager in this case would be PMA Asset Management. So moved. Second. Motion by Dan, second by Ken. Any other questions on this one or comments, discussion? <laughs> so that's just joining it. And then you mentioned, I guess, where does it go from here as far as like your risk? You mentioned risk tolerance level. Where does it go from here once you're joined from board approval or your decision making on how um, does it go once you're part of the the first monies would need to be in there for january 1st if then the second part of what we're going to talk to you tonight takes place um so in between now and january we could put the money in there and put it in at the ultra conservative level and then wait until we had a chance to talk to the board about what risk level we would want to take on the spectrum of what options that they have but um we would bring that to the board for their choice but we could go with the lowest option the lowest risk <laughs> but we want to be making money on that 1.6 million maybe we'll get a chance to come back october november or december we do have that time i'll be learning a lot more in the upcoming months um we can join without putting any money in there as well so this this is just to join, and then there'll be a secondary step. You know. And the returns, anticipate the returns from being in this trust will be greater than the returns for making straight BMO? Yes. Okay. Um, depending on your risk level. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get a motion by Jen, or by Jan and Ken on Part E, which is the uh, point, uh, the advisor agreement, and then appointing the investment manager. Other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We have a uh, resolution authorizing adoption of a post employment health reimbursement arrangement for active and retired employees. Um. So this is part two on the document on the screen. Um, so we're proposing tonight to change the trust plan benefits that are paid to a post-employment health reimbursement arrangement. And Dean's gonna give you kind of a high-level overview and I'm gonna go into specifics. So just to kind of you know think back to the past, we did not have a fund 73 multiple years ago. So in the past, we were what we called a pay-as-you-go school district. And a lot of school districts are pay as you go. The downside to that is you are constantly every year trying to take an educated guess as to how many of your folks that are eligible for social retirement benefits are actually going to implement that decision. So you may put aside $200,000 in your budget, but maybe $300,000 or what the requests are made that year. So obviously that becomes an issue for your budget. We had an opportunity to create Fund 73. We worked with you, the board, to do that. And as Kim has stated now, there's more than a million dollars in that account. Now you have those dollars available. It's not fully funded, but you now have funding source available so that if your educated numbers that you put into your budget are off, you have a way of, of addressing that fiscal need. One of the things that's important to note is over the years, we've had feedback from retiring staff members 
that they would appreciate a greater level of latitude to utilize the post appointment benefit. So up to this point and currently, the only option that they have is that they can utilize those dollars available to them that they have earned towards school district insurance. So whatever dollars they have available to them after retirement, they can put it towards a single or family plan and that's it. Some of these folks, they get out, they don't use that right away. They have a spouse who provides them with insurance and maybe they don't need to access this until they're eligible for Medicare. Well, our current situation didn't allow them to take those dollars and use them as part of a Medicare wraparound plan or to use those dollars for other medical needs that are approved through the IRS. What Kim's about to propose is that we implement something here and we're gonna ask you the board to consider that in a nutshell, people that are eligible and currently enrolled in utilizing their funds, that they would be grandfathers and they could continue that until they use those funds up. But if somebody is eligible and not using them, or if somebody's not eligible yet, but will be in the future, that we would not have them on the district plan anymore. We would get them right into this more flexible situation. So it does two things. It benefits the employee in that they have a much greater level of latitude of how they use those dollars. And from feedback that we've had, as people tell us they can make, they can stretch those dollars a lot more if, if it's more flexible. It's beneficial to the district in that as we get older, we find that, what's my dad call it, the general wearing out process. And we find ourselves needing more medical care. And that drives up the usage for the district. One of the things that you've heard us talk about for years now is we work together with our staff to try to be thoughtful of our usage. Because if we can stabilize that, or even better yet, get it to go down, then it makes our interactions with the insurance companies more beneficial because we don't see those big spikes and in increases um, to people's insurance costs. So we're looking at this as a potential win-win. Um, we're trying to be thoughtful of people that are currently drawing it and to be able to still allow them to stay on the district if they wanted to. Um, but for the people who are not currently utilizing it, that we would just move them over into this, this in the future. Okay, so just before I speak on this, we have a current OPEP plan that has been in place since 2008, and that allows retirees uh, to use their balance that's been created to purchase district health or dental insurance, health and dental or health or dental insurance. So that's our current plan. That current plan will actually stay active. It's not automatically being closed through this recommendation. We would just have two plans and would allow us to transition uh, to the post-employment health uh, reimbursement arrangement plan during the time. So we have options to do both. Uh, Debbie, if you can scroll down to the yellow chart there. Um, just for some background before I get into some detail, the retirees that currently have balances as of July 1st is 42. Um, so those have those people have retired and have a balance. Of those retirees, 18 are on health insurance and 31 are on the dental insurance. Some have both health and dental and uh, there's a, quite a few that just have dental. And there are five um, active retirees that just have a balance and haven't tapped into their balance at all. There are currently 32 employees that are on the list that have met the requirements, which is over 55, so many years of service and have a balance. 32 that are coming up that still work at the district. So they're not retired yet, but they're eligible to be retired. So back up in the chart. So what we're pro proposing here tonight is that the OPEB funds um, would be placed in the post-employment health reimbursement arrangement. It could be used on medical insurance premiums in the marketplace, such as health, dental, and vision, um, and or they can also use it on IRS allowed medical expenses. That would be similar to like a flex funding account if any of you have that. Uh, you turn in your receipt, you buy some eyeglasses, they could use the money for that as well. Uh, 
uh, next, the health, the HRA plan uh, would be administered by a third party. So when a, a person would retire, we would determine however their sick balance bank would turn into their OPEP balance, and then that would be given to the third party provider and they would manage that balance. So we, the district, are no longer managing how much um, uh, they have anymore. It's done through that and it's theirs to keep and there's IRS rules related to that. Next, uh, the plan would also provide an expert to help the retiree navigate the medical insurance marketplace. That would be through that third party provider. So current retirees, those that are on, those 42 that are in the plan now, um, and they are currently receiving district medical insurance. They may choose to remain on the district health or combined health and dental plan if they choose not to transition to this HRA plan. They may remain on the district's health insurance and dental, health or health and dental, until their OPEP balance has been exhausted. So we're allowing that option, but if they choose the HRE option, then they go to that and they can't go back the other way. The other um, component to this is you may choose to remain on the district dental plan only. These are for the ones that are only using it for dental for a period of 18 months. If they choose not to transition to this HRA, once the 18 month period is expired, the retiree will be required to transition to the HRA with their remaining OPEP balance. Um, so those retirees that are eligible but currently not receiving a district health insurance will follow the new HRA plan in the future when they decide to access their benefits. And they do have the option to stay on the district health and dental for a period of 18 months through COBRA. That still need to be offered to each retiree. So uh, the change here would require the approval of the resolution in F. Um, to be able to uh, offer this plan, but it doesn't close our current OPEP plan and allow us to transition. So eventually with transition, it would all, everyone would be moved over to that. Right, the ones that uh, would, if they chose to stay in the plan with their health or combined health and dental, the thought is, is that the health costs are so high that their funds will be depleted and it won't take 20 years to deplete their funds that would be depleted oh. within a few years. Um, but it would allow them to stay if that's what they felt most comfortable with. And just to point out, Kim and I talked about, we already emailed out to the current retirees that have funds left to let them know that this is a possibility of coming. Um, and then we also told them that as soon as the board made decision, if they went to this, we would hold them and have them come in if they wanted to and have some answer questions and things like that options and different things so that they weren't just locked out with no decisions or questions being answered. Good reaction? No, a lot of like Dean had shared, we as we offer people and retirees, they're constantly saying, is there options just to wrap around it or just Medicare? And right now is the point where Medicare open and enrollment's gonna open in October. So we gotta give them the choice that if they want to go for January one into Medicare they go. Yes, we're, we're telling you now, so they have the time to go to the marketplace, but this would be effective January 1st. Yeah. A lot more options available. Right. To use. Yeah. I would move that we adopt post-employment post health reimbursement arrangement. Motion by Ken. Second. Second by Adam. Any other open discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right. Professor Bonds. So as a board, you took an action <laughs> at a previous board meeting to identify the use of ESSER dollars as related to two one-time payments of a thousand dollars for current employees. So we put together a table because one of the next questions that is you have to decide who of the employees are you looking at that you would have received this thousand dollar payment. And in a nutshell, you're looking at your full-time employees, but of course there's some nuances. So we wanted you to be aware of the first draft that we put together um, and take your questions. And then ultimately 
if you approve of this, that we would move forward with those payments. If you scroll down a little bit to the bottom, Debbie, and then we'll go back up. Here's a few decisions that we just got to make sure everybody's aware of. Um, ultimately, the person has to be physically employed here as of October 17th, 2022. This would be paid on October 28th in a separate payroll. And that uh, if a person holds multiple pay types, they would only receive this once. So an example is, you know, when we put on there, you know, bus drivers with X number of trips required, we've shared that you know, we might have somebody that's in a teaching role, but they also do bus driving. They wouldn't receive the payment twice. They would receive the payment once. So Debbie, if you could scroll back up a little bit. This gives you an idea. Food services, yes. Teaching staff, support staff, administration, yes. Um, people who are summer school only, no. Bus drivers, yes. Um, we also said on there, yes to any drivers with 20 trips between September 1 and, and May 30th. So if you're a, a regular sub, you could also earn this. So that's another way of trying to promote more folks coming in and doing some subbing. Oh, you're on that note, though. If, if that's a situation with the sub or even a driver, this, if you're a sub, you might not have that many trips in yet by the first payment date. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. So then would, your be, would, would you wait to pay that out until the end of May? Then? Yeah, we had, we had talked about trying, wasn't it the end of the year, to try to... Um, I believe you look at uh, the different incentives that are at the bus garage uh, once or twice during the school year. So we'll probably look at it maybe before Christmas. And if somebody met that requirement that was a substitute, then they would get paid at that time, not at the October time. So that's the only exception to the October. Would it be more of a, hey, we check on it every now and then, or hey, once you hit your 20, you shouldn't make them wait. Right. Yeah. Uh, we can work with Brandy on that um, to make sure we're watching it. So you're saying after they hit their 20 trips, they get their $1,000. Right. So all regular bus drivers that we have now will meet that by the October time. That would be any substitute uh, that's helping out during the year. So it's a way of trying to expand it beyond just your regular route drivers. So the sub can get it. If they do at least 20 trips, yeah. Fitness workers, yes, if, uh, average more than five hours a week. Is this, would this include all part-time, any part-time employees? Yeah. Would the, would the uh, $1,000 be prorated for those people? Right now, that one is specifically to the fitness center. I think we identified that we have a different one for part-times these are all the employee classifications that we have that we get sorted by pay types <laughs> so if it doesn't go by hours it goes by if they're in that classification uh, no proration it, it doesn't matter if you're full-time or part-time just in some of these categories we put a minimum requirement of how many hours to work in order to be eligible for it so i think to go back to ken's question that is if they're less than that We've accepted it in a support staff role, but we gave that specific guidance for fitness. Um, we don't, I don't think we have anybody underneath that in the support staff role that was less. Can you give me an example who would, like, who would be a summer only staff? Like, so we have some students that are summer only. That's all that's in the bucket is the summer ground staff, pretty much. And they're made up primarily of students. Is, is every full-time employee of the district covered under this plan? That's important except, before. Except for their exceptions that are noted. Coaches. Well, they're not oh, that's not, not full-time. Full to me, that's not full-time. He's saying full-time, yes. Yeah. So if they're implied on or before the 17th. So I, I guess that's step number one. I just want to understand we all agree that this is every full-time 
employee of the Oconto Falls School District as of October 17th, no matter years of service. They could be here for one week, but if you're here that day, mm -hmm. they get it. Yes. Okay. And it's full time. Or you said there aren't any. We don't have any part time people in these categories. No, there's part time. Mm -hmm. But there, the there only are exceptions are those two. You know. Um, so support staff, there is no exception, um, but most are far exceed the hour requirement there, so we did put an exception. But yes, part-time and full-time, no different in treatment. So step one, I, I full-heartedly approve of any and all full-time employees. That's just me speaking out loud. And me speaking out loud again, I'm all for bus drivers because of me desperately need to support them the best we can. I guess I'm a little bit stuck on the fitness center if you're only working five hours a week. Five hours a week. I just need some, maybe some more talking points on that. I agree with that. That stuck out to me as a point of, point of contention in my, yeah. in my head. We're not married to this. You know, it's okay. This is just a draft. This is something sure. to start the conversation. For me, the, uh, you know, full time uh, and part time people being treated the same <laughs> sounds a little unfair. I think, think of it as maybe not part time as regular versus not. So, like some of the fitness centers, we have some people that fill in a, a, at a 5.30 morning slot, and they mm -hmm. do it once a month, if that. They just kind of fill in where there's, where there's like multiple people to share a job. Mm -hmm. So, they're not a regular. So, that's why I think the hour wasn't necessarily deemed them as part-time. Yeah. All of our fitness centers would be part-time. It was there are some that are, work, are regular, so they're there more than five hours a week. Showing up every day, they're every day versus I just need a coverage this tomorrow morning, and we have one person that covered one time in three months because it was just I guess, coverage thing. Yeah, I guess, and maybe I'd make a comment here. You know, board members, I agree. No, coaches only. I mean, we have our you know, schedule, pay schedules on coaches. I mean, that makes that makes sense. Event workers, I agree really appreciate the event workers you know for what they do and help out with and i think for the fitness center if if the point is it's regular you know that they're like clockwork we got them there all the time we're talking about four thousand dollars at some point at some point there's a kind of dividing line and you either go above or over that's probably the only group that we could say, well, maybe it doesn't make sense or it does make sense. Um, I, I'd kind of leave that to, you know, summer staff, the, that, that makes sense. So I think the only contentious area and Brian was kind of getting to it is, is that fitness center piece. But for the sake of $4,000 uh, in year one, and if you think that's money well spent, for the regular service that they are providing on a very regular basis. I, 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 guess, I, yeah, together, I, I guess I, I, I guess <clears throat> I just struggle it. And again, I'm not taking away from their their time that they're putting in because we're all very thankful of that. But to say, you know, everyone who's putting in 40 plus hours, that's what we want to drive towards and say, this is what the thank you's for. And again, I thank them for the work, but to say, hey, now someone at 25 hours is getting the same thing, you're going to cause a storm. Yeah, I don't think it's it's even, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I, mean, I, I feel like it might be a little bit taken, taken in a way that, you know, we're comparing apples to oranges a little bit. Of the, there are a total of four fitness center employees or four that would qualify so, so there's this one there's only there may be two of the four that qualify but if the other ones there's currently four total four total and of the four you're thinking about two would qualify based on this based on this yes so what's the our roughly our differential between 
the two and the two as far as the employees, two employees who don't qualify and two who do. That's where it comes in a regular two of them are just kind of sub they fill in here and there. They're really not a, on a schedule to, to be there for us. It's kind of more or less, hey, we have no one to work tomorrow morning. Can you cover, come in? and Or they're there working out and they're like, hey, so and so can't do the morning shift. I'm there anyways. Okay. I'll open up. So then the two who are a regular, yep. have they been doing this for us for multiple years? Yes, yes. Given that, I kind of like the way it's written. The two that have been doing it for a few years now. I mean, are, are they over twenty-five hours a week? Are they pushing for you? I mean, or, I mean, I'm just trying to get an understanding of the one that works the most hours is not pushing forty hours a week. Okay, but neither is a bus driver. Bus driver, it's hard to get those. <laughs> well, I think you know, a couple things. No good deed is going to go unpunished. We're trying to do something good for as many people as we can. We have a, an opportunity now to do that. Um, I would say that every single year when we decide on some given number of a percentage to increase people's pay, that is the most unfair thing you can get. You can't take that percentage to the store and buy something. So if somebody is making 60 grand a year versus somebody who's making 30 grand a year, that 2% is not equal. Because obviously the $60,000 a year person is getting more than the $30,000 a year. But you still have the same buying needs. So this would be one little tiny way to honor everyone with a, the same number. They're all putting in the effort that we ask of them. They're the ones that we're rewarding are doing that and if somebody gets a little uptight because you know if the sixty thousand dollar a year person is upset because the thirty thousand dollar a year got the same number well it's their turn and I, th I think we just need to look at it a little bit more globally um you know if i were the person at the fitness center and came in every now and then just to help out and somebody handed me a thousand bucks i think i'd be pretty embarrassed at that point i think there's a pretty good dividing point based on the discussion here tonight. I'd like to see us do it, this payout according to the schedule. I guess it, you know, Jan's stand on percent versus bucks. It's been irritating me for years, <laughs> but. <laughs> uh, and, and if we were talking about salary increases, I would definitely uh, agree with uh, with you on that I guess but I, I look at this as kind of a bonus it's uh you know it, it is adding to compensation but it's a bonus and so I I, I can cannot see an issue or a problem with uh, providing that bonus based on the number of hours of service that a that, a, that an employee uh, provides to us. I just feel the needle keeps moving. And, and, and again, I, under, I understand where you're coming from, but shades of gray get, it just keeps expanding them. And, and it gets to a point of, well, this doesn't, I mean. When, when we first talked about this, I, Dean, I remember, um, I remember talking about there being um, discussions about how it was a contentious topic that the teachers or the staff were you know were disappointed with the the decision to with the two two point five CPI and as a way to kind of remediate that decision. And correct me if I'm wrong. This this was an idea to to kind of bolster that that decision and to retroactively improve that the feelings about that two point five. So in looking at this, if, if that was the, the goal of this, looking back at the, the goal, which was to to go back and look at the people who may or may have felt like the 2.5 wasn't fair, um, I guess is a fitness center employee some, someone that would have been affected by that 2.5 or the 4.7? Is, 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 is that completing our, our goal? The goal that 
fact we had talked about? I would say minimally because of just the, the low number of hours that they work in the district. So to go back with what you were saying, so when we initially looked at this as a school <laughs> district, we saw a CPI of 4.7. Um, the district was faced with, do you do a 4.7 or not? Um, we showed you what that 4.7 did in our forecast model. Um, and presented you with the potential of doing a 2.5. So again, let's just go back in history a little bit. So prior to 2015, seven years prior, five of those seven years, employees in our school district were at or below the CPI. Of the two years that they were above the CPI, one of those was a negative CPI in our district did a freeze. And one of them that was a positive number and we were above it. So that gives you an idea of the ground we were trying to make up since 2015. We didn't make up much ground until we passed the referendum in operation in 2017. Passing that operational referendum enabled us then to address wages. We were able to implement an alt count model. And since 2017, we have done a 2.5% in each of the employee groups. That has been above the CPI every year until this year. So this is the first year it's been above. Now I will say this, it's different in the certified group because when you say the support staff group, then each one of those individuals is getting 2.5%. In the certified group, the group gets 2.5, but not everybody in that group got 2.5. If you were at the lower end of the spectrum, you got more than 2.5, and if you're in the upper end, you got less than 2.5. But you also were in an old comp model where you had an ability where extra dollars were also placed to provide you with the ability to accelerate. During that same time, we were doing market adjustments for individuals and trying to ensure that we were competitive with the market in our area. So all of that's going on and then as a district, you had to decide were you gonna do the 4.7. The board chose to do a 2.5. After that decision, we start getting more information as to we watch the, the rate of inflation continue to just go out of sight. And the cost of gas, the cost of food continues to rise. We then come back to you as a board and we tell you, listen, in reflecting now with more information, can we use these ESSER dollars to try to give something back to the employee groups with the use of these one-time dollars? So you approved that two $1,000 payments once this year, once next year. That will bring a majority of people up to the CPI, not everybody. People that are, as Jan stated, people that are on the hey guys, end of the range, it won't be at the CPI because they're at a higher wage. So as was stated, a percent for one is not the same as a percent for the other. So going to your question with those four people, were they part of all that initial thought process? Not really, because those people are working maybe an hour or two a day, okay? Versus a majority of the folks, a, a significant majority of the folks are probably working six to seven and a half hours a day, if not more. So, we, as you can imagine, trying to put this list together is difficult because we're putting faces and names together here. Um, we're trying not to do that with you. We didn't want to give you a list of a bunch of names. We wanted to try to do this. So you're just simply looking at it more in, in a generality. So if, if, if from your perspective, you feel that, that that's kind of an outlier, we can remove that. Um, but I mean, we, we, we recognize that these people are providing a service on a daily basis in our district. Now, one struggle with that is your coaches are as well, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you want to look at it from that standpoint, um, for somebody that, that coaches in three sports, they're, they're doing the same thing. Um, 
and that that was that's honest that was honestly part of my whole that pulled back too is that there we have a significant amount of coaches that provide a great deal of service to our students on a daily basis and they're not included so i i guess i and maybe it's because there's just such a small number of fitness center employees but is that is that a reason just to to throw them in and it's probably only two to four grand but like to me like two to four grand we can throw it back into hvac like i don't know i just so i i i'm just gonna have one more thing so we were briefed earlier tonight saying, here's what our teachers are saying. And one of our lowest scoring things was the district's pay practices are fair. 43%, less than 50%. Average of 2.75, which falls on another 2.97. That's one of the worst things we scored on. And now, again, I don't want to haggle over $4,000, but if we're going to start giving money away to individuals who are working 20, 25 hours a week, how, how does that equal the fair part on this? That's where I'm having my problem. And again, I've abstained from a vote previously on coaches only things, but I'm just gonna use this as an example. You know, I have someone that I would have to abstain if we put coaches in here, but I'm like, then if a fitness center person is gonna get it, then the coach should get it because I know that individual putting a lot of darn hours out of her own time to go help this district. So I guess, I'll make a motion right now to accept as is, granted we take fitness center out. Not as is, I make a motion we approve this by taking fitness center out. I second. Motion by Brian, second by Chad, to approve as presented with the modification of fitness center uh, being removed, but all others that are designated on here uh, to be included. Open up for any other discussion. Going back to Jerry's discussion with um, coaches and how, where are we at for coaches that are employees of the district? We've got 28 coaches of those coaches. I don't remember the percentage, but would that even be knocked back quite a bit that they're already they're already getting a bonus? Some percentage. I can't tell you the exact number, but less than half. These are coaches only. Yeah. Okay. So they don't do anything else for us. That's right. only coaching. Um, my comment on that is, you know, Brian, you make a point. Uh, you know, I see what you're saying. I absolutely get that. And given that, I, I will tell you now, I will in, in the vote, I will support that motion. Um, if it's a fairness issue and that's the way the rest of the board votes, you know, I, I'll go along with that. Um, my only regret is that we, you know, it wasn't more global, too. Um, I kind of hate throwing a few people under those buses that we can't keep running anyway. <laughs> You know, if they're expense for somebody else, I, I get your point. Yeah, and, and again, I don't want to take away from the fitness center and the time that the hours they put in, but to the coaches only aspect, I, I know how much this individual puts in of her time outside of my family, and it's a lot of hours. It's all coaches, and that's that's you know, it's yeah. it, it, I'll leave it at that. You know, to it for a round trip on buses. How long are you on that bus in the morning, roughly? Two hours or it a half? It depends on the route. Um, I would say that they have a minimum of an hour and 15 to an hour and 45 for a morning or an afternoon. That's so just one if they're, trip. Yep, so if you're doing a morning route, you might be an hour and 15 or an hour and 30 minutes on the road, but you had 15 minutes investing in doing your pre-trip inspection turn it into the fourth group. And then if they do it at night, then it's basically they oh, got four, eight, hours, three, four hours, three and a half to four hours a day. Okay, so again with the fitness here, they only have to put in five hours a week. A bus driver is doing that almost one day. So my eyes, I just don't think it's fair for the bus drivers 
almost doing that in one day. And they're getting treated as they're somebody put in five hours and yeah. you're saying they need 20 of those to meet one of the five hour requirements of the fifth so quarter. I, I don't I don't have a problem if they have to wait 20 trips to get their money. It's just a bus driver is working four hours a day and the fitness has to work five hours a week. So why is it fair for men? Again, then we're having mm -hmm. issue with bus drivers. So, yeah. Uh, I have one more question, sorry. Long-term, are long-term subs a part of this? If a long-term sub is through teachers on call, they would not be part of this because they're not in the school district. Okay. Okay. Listen, good good discussion all around. I think you have to kind of have a dividing line, and I think that you know the motion on the on the floor is a is a good dividing line. I, I want us to walk away from this conversation an extremely positive sentiment, right? This is a we're in a fortunate position with the ESSER funds to be able to do this. You know, as Brian mentioned, uh, you know, one of the lowest ranking areas was the was the pay practices, and hopefully, this goes a long way in a positive sense for the administrator, for the, uh, uh, the you know staff, support staff, bus drivers, teachers, administration, everyone that's working in the district. Um, you know, views this positively, and also, you know, <laughs> retention thing possibly for next year too. It's another thousand dollars next year that uh, these people would would get. So. You know, I, I'm appreciative that we're able to even even offer this, but there has to be kind of that dividing line, and um, the the motion on the floor is 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 uh, you know kind of puts that line of demarcation uh, there. So, so where does the rest of that money go? At, if we don't use the rest of that ESSER money, where does that go? Did we just put it in it? it we will sugar. We will we will use we'll this. use it. Where though? on um, whether it's HDOC or other areas of maintenance district. Okay. It can be used. If you Just, don't use it, you lose it. Right. Yeah. Please. There's conversations right now where they looked at potentially expanding those dates because some of the problems that districts are running into is they have ways that they want to use it and they can't get the items. So if you're wanting to implement HVAC, well you order it and it's a year and a half delayed. So they're looking at potentially expanding that time frame when they can be used. But do we have plans for that just in case they don't extend it? We have we have plans. The question is, will you be able to implement the plan? But right now I'm pretty confident that we'll either be able to implement the plan or we'll fall into a time standard because we won't be the only ones in that situation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes, yeah, my my comment. I know we don't need to drag it off long any further, but I'm on the fence either way. Brian, you're pretty much dragging me to your side of the fence. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I, I wanted to say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> by the way, I respect everyone's thoughts, but boy, <laughs> um, I look at it like Ken said that it's a bonus. You know, kind of a hey, here you go. There's no way to make it fair for everybody, but. I it'd be nice to be able to show them appreciation. Thank you for being a regular employee. You know, it might not be a full-time employee. Thank you for showing up in the morning. Thank you for showing up in the evening. Thank you for providing a service to our community members that show up to the fitness center. I mean, in today's world of you go to Burger King and well, we can't serve you inside because we don't have any employees. And that's the same with the fitness center. Even though it's they don't put a lot of time in, they're in there early in the morning, in the evenings to provide a service to the community. So I I understand where you're coming from, but I also look at the side on the other side of it. Of I hate to not be able to say thank you for showing up in the morning. Okay. Uh, all in favor of the uh, motion as presented. Um, all of the uh, employee groups that we mentioned up there or that were shown would be paid. Uh, absent the fitness center uh, line item. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried.
district hazardous plans. So I just want to make you the board aware that we received concern from a member of the community in regards to um, hazardous traffic situation along Farm Road. And I have worked with the city, also with the sheriff from Ocala County to come and view the situation, which it's a valid concern. The concern is the amount of congestion on Farm Road during drop-off and pickup times. Um, we talked a little bit earlier in this meeting that in a nutshell, we had some conversation before the school year started because we anticipated um, an exacerbated situation. When you reduce services to the one mile, you can expect that you're going to have some students walking. Um, and some of those students will also be riding a car that previously transported by a bus. So in a nutshell, the plan um, includes having crossing guards at three different spots on Farm Road to include the specific intersection that was brought to my attention by the concerned parent, which is the intersection of Farm and Sunrise Court. Besides having those three that are district folks, then you have the one that's sponsored half and half between the district and the city down at Farm and Main Street. The statute that the parent um, brought to my attention is statute 121.54, paragraph 9. And in that, it talks about what a district has to do if a parent feels that, um, that the situation is hazardous and by statute there's requirements that have to be implemented so within 30 days of receiving the concern the school district has to bring a plan to you the board so in a nutshell i created a, a draft document that goes through and identifies you know what was the antecedent to the problem for us it was that one mile radius not being able to be serviced due to a lack of bus drivers um, Ultimately, we recognize that there's a challenge, and that challenge is that the high volume of vehicular traffic um, relative to students and pedestrians and takes into account the response of the school district and the city, which I've talked to you about already, and the fact that we're now implementing that. Um, had the sheriff come out and observe that with me during the, the second week of school, and at this point, um, I need to brief you the board. And as a school district, we need to reply within 30 days to this concerned parent. A copy of that plan is then sent to the sheriff's department as well as to the state superintendent. Um, the parent then has the opportunity, according to statute, to decide if they feel that that mitigates the concern. If they feel it doesn't mitigate the concern, then they could talk to the state superintendent and ask the state superintendent whether or not they feel that the concern is mitigated. And then there's timelines that the state superintendent has to adhere to relative to their response. So I will tell you that in this specific situation, when we had transportation services, the bus used to stop right at the intersection of farm and Sunrise Court, and students would get out of the bus and cross over. Right now, we actually have a person there to cross the students in that same intersection. So I don't see where um, transportation piece for this situation would at all be helpful. Now, could I see where it could be more helpful elsewhere in the community? Absolutely. Being we have all kinds of kids coming from all over in that one mile radius. Chad, you brought up one example earlier on County I. So in my world, if something like that needs to be changed, I would think that you would consider pulling back together that transportation committee and that committee encompass board members, members of the transportation department, and members of the ops. 
So we would bring that back together to determine what choices do you have. And I will say this, part of that that we struggled as that committee group, there's a lot of folks that would really like to come up with a way that their children in that one mile radius should be the exception. And I'm sure that there's lots of folks that have a pretty valid reason because it's a hardship. That decision was not made lightly at all. And so to kind of like people are not aware that in that first week of school and in the second week of school, law enforcement was at multiple intersections downtown out by the um, what was the housing development out there? Manufactured house. Thank you. And out on County I as well. And as was Mr. Spice. So people were kind of sharing how many students did they see at those intersections to decide what level of need was there. It's not, it's not a exact science because if you are the parent of the one or two or five children that are at that intersection, you're very concerned about what happens at that intersection. If you're at an intersection that has 40 kids, I will tell you because I was there with my clicker and it was between 30 and 45 people cross the intersection at Main and Farm in the morning or the afternoon. So I did that for six or seven days and there's a significant number of people, which is why the decision was made to make, make that a designated spot. The other, the other intersection didn't have near that much traffic, whether it be vehicular or pedestrian. So the district has an obligation to reply to this concern. I understand the concern. I think between the district and the city actions have been taken. Um, I guess I pitch out to the board at this point, I mean, do you feel that there's something else that we ought to be doing specific to the Sunrise Court and Farm Road piece? Um, is that a lot, are, are these um, crossing guards, and I think you said something earlier in the meeting too, um, are staff, school staff, and are these long term, they're going to be there all year? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so get each entrance and exit and then sunrise court. Yep. Okay. Is I just I wanted to clarify just to make sure that it wasn't just for an, the next couple of weeks until things like calm down that it was a long standing solution. Right now the intent is that it's all year. Yeah. Which is which is a drain on the resource. But it's felt that the need is there. Sorry. Oh no, that's okay. I um, have the um, sheriff and the chief of police given any feedback on how they feel it's working or any opinions or well, can, anything that you can repeat? I can tell you the sheriff was surprised at, at the amount of, of traffic mm -hmm. um, because I don't know that he had been there personally at those times. Okay. Um, was appreciative of the work that everybody was trying to do to mitigate that. Um, but in both cases, law enforcement brought forward the fact that they were observing this in the first week or week and a half of the process. And to some extent, we have observed some changes. So the elementary decided to start letting kids in earlier than their initial plan, which had the traffic flowing faster, not faster like driving, but from the time it started to the time it ended, that congested time was less. Um, and also, I think we're starting to see families are understanding that if they adjust their pickup and drop off time a little bit earlier or later, um, they can avoid the, the kind of the mass buildup all at once. As you can imagine, if everybody's trying to get through a bottleneck in the same seven or eight minutes, it's, it's just a crazy amount of traffic versus if people at the end of the day decide, well, I'm not going to pick my child up until 25 after 3.30, um, then they're right at the tail end and they're not dealing with the line all the way down the farm road. I'm sorry, all the way down the main street. Um, Chad, you had a chance to see some of the first hand. So I did it a morning and I'm thinking, these people must be taking pictures at the right time. And they're like, 
there's like hardly any traffic. And then school came out. I mean, it's lined up. Um, my, my main concern is that there's a lot of parents are mad at us, but we can't do nothing about it. I mean, we don't have drivers, you don't have drivers. Um, it's, there's other plans that you can do so you're not sitting on farm road. I sat down there two days, I think it was two days I spent down there. And there, our parents are going on the other side of Main Street and having their kids walk down there and then jumping in their car. There's some people are parking in the cemetery and kids are jumping in. I mean, if you move around, you know, like, was it Sun, Sun Court, you said? Sun, Sun, if people, parents would park there, I mean, they, there's other options that wind up on farm road. That's, I don't know how you think about that, but I mean, that you would have, just say, 10 parents are down on the other side of farm road or by the cemetery. I mean, that's 10 cars, 15 cars, I mean, you eliminate. Um, I'm just throwing this out there. What if I brought it up once before? What if we would take the buses and park them in the back and then have the parents pick up up in front and you can feel both sides of the road? So at this point, one of the things that's been brought up is um, because we've had there's been at least two or three different folks have stopped in and they've had ideas, you know, do you make um, Maria Volk Drive part of the situation and, you know, create a new driveway and, and try to, you know, not have it be such a bottleneck on the farm road. You've had somebody say, do you make farm road one way and that way you don't have two way traffic going on. I mean, there's been, a lot of things that have been pitched out there and what law enforcement is saying is before we get too far down trying to fix something let's let's try to see how this rolls for the next few weeks um to better understand will human beings start to change some of their patterns in order to shake it out themselves and i gave one example before about everybody's trying to get in there between 310 and 320 it's a lot more difficult because you got a 10 minute window versus if you have some people stretch that out to 325, 330, 335, then you don't see near the level of congestion. And so the thought process is before you start doing a big fix, let's try to figure out how big the challenge is a few weeks down the road. So we've already seen a pretty significant change just in two weeks. Um, I'm not going to say it's, it's good, but it's better than it was. Um, first few days was, was really challenging, but it's gotten better. When the district files the report with the state in, in the prescribed number of days, um, does it, I don't remember if you said, does it have to have evidence that law enforcement was involved with the fix? It's, it's my understanding that for this specific situation, um, where somebody's reporting it to you and you're responding, um, law enforcement's involvement is the district's response to the, in this case, the parent, needs to be shared with the sheriff of the county and the state superintendent. Okay, my thinking was that if, if law enforcement was with us early, if they were invited back now, when we're a few weeks into it, um, if you be within your right to ask them to share in a response with you to the state or something. Yeah, and, and we did bring law enforcement into it. I mean, before this concern was even brought forward right. by the parent, 
we were involved with city law enforcement because that's their jurisdiction. Um, and then after the parent had come forward, I talked to the sheriff and he came. So we've implemented, we've talked about the fact that we had those conversations and I guess the, the goal is to just get multiple eyes on. Okay. So the two days that I did crosswalk and there was an officer there in the morning and night. And so we would have them on our side already, correct? The city has been very helpful with, as you stated, um, they were placing members of their staff that were on rotation during those times. They, We've asked them, they've offered to have them available so an example, in the mornings, you would see them parked on Main Street. Main Street's kind of a, a tough situation because when children are present, it's supposed to be 15 miles an hour. And um, you have some folks traveling 30 to 40 miles an hour. And it's very concerning if you're standing there observing, some of those folks are on their phones, they're not paying attention. And so having that, that police car there, as you all, <laughs> Most likely, no, no matter how fast you're going, when you see a squad car, your first thing is to look at your speed and slow down. Okay, the brakes. It's a deterrent. <laughs> um, they've also been on farm road. We also, if you look out here, um, Mr. Winkler from the city, worked with members of their team, they put in a couple posts and they have an electronic sign up now that shows the speed. That sign can be turned so that you know, it'll work either way. And it can also be removed and put on a different pole. And so right now the thought process, they put multiple poles around the community. They'll move that sign, but they've also ordered more signs. So at some point they won't have to move it. They'll just swivel it once in a while. Um, but they're already looking to put one on Main Street as well, according to Chief Wilson. Um, they've also ordered some of those safety green. It's almost like a yellow green, real bright neon with the uh, slow pedestrian sign on it and hoping to put those on farm and, and made as well did they find any signs i know i was talking to john about it where they had the school crossing where it was flashing and then it said 15 miles an hour when yeah. present I, didn't in that. I know that those ones that one that's at the intersection there that we carry out bring yeah. back i think that was the one that been part of the grant or something because I know, I do remember talking, there were like $2,500 a piece, but obviously you would probably want two of them down there. I mean, it, before you crossed, before I even stepped out, you up because what Dean said, there's people on their phone, don't even look. So if you would have a flash and sign, I guess it would be up to us to purchase one of them flash and signs were you know better maybe the city or the city or or even could even help the city yeah to pay for it. I mean so I guess for tonight do you need my question you have to inform us do you need any action from us so ultimately my response as I see it is to acknowledge um what the issue is, which I've done. Um, talk about the observed challenges, share the, share the immediate response, and what we're trying to do to mitigate the risks. So everything that we've talked about today, I guess my question to you, the board, is is there anything from your perspective that needs to be added to that response? Or is there anything that I've shared that you feel is not? I guess, I think the response and everything is appropriate. Um, and the approach of, you know, it, it needs a couple more weeks of seeing out human nature, how, you know, where are the other problem areas? Do you, do you anticipate giving another update on, in the October meeting? Do you see any need to get the transportation committee together at any point in time? What, what do you need from us to support? I'm not sure that we'll know much more between now and October. Um, so I, I can give an update 
in October, or I can give it when I know more. Okay. Ultimately, from here, I'll send it to the individual. If, if they respond to me, because they can decide that they feel that we've addressed their concern and it stops there, or they can inform me that they're going to take this further to the state superintendent. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking, bring it to you. I guess I'm thinking broader than just the, than just this, the, the hazard plan of, you know, maybe we just have a transportation update on that uh, uh, as an agenda item for, you know, maybe the next, next couple of meetings where it's simply, if there's items we want to discuss, like, did we get any new bus drivers? any issues with any of the crosswalks. It's just a kind of a placeholder for the next, because we know this is a topic that you know, until we're all comfortable, we, we have it on there as a standing, standing item. In the meantime, is it helpful for you if we somehow acknowledge formally that you presented this response, it's gonna to go to the state, we could do that in the form of a motion? Okay. I'll make that motion. Motion by Jan, second by Sarah. Um, basically, board acknowledging the uh, plan as drafted, and uh, the the dean will be sending it off to the uh, state as appropriate. Sending off to the individual. Indivi sorry, to the individual as appropriate. Yep. I think it also goes to the sheriff. Copy. Of the reply is sent to the sheriff and the state. Okay. Send, send the copy of a uh, bus driver employment application along with that. <laughs> and, and have a supply of those. <laughs> anybody that complains about that. Here. All right. Any other? I think we probably had enough discussion on it. Anybody else have anything else? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Health and dental insurance policies. So you should have in your packet uh, dental and health proposal and a recommendation. We're recommending no change to the current. Um, what are we to continue with Robin Health for the 2023 year? Um, in a nutshell, it, it provides the greatest stability for our staff and their ability to stay with their insurance carrier. We have decreased our usage as a district, and for that reason, Robin Health has actually come in instead of with an increase in costs, a negative 1.5%. So, even though it came in at a negative 1.5, as a district, we still went out to bid. As you can see, um, Wisconsin Counties Association, which is years ago, we used to be with Wisconsin yeah. Counties. Um, unfortunately, they had gone up and through a bidding process, we ended up leaving them. They're now being aggressive to try to get our business again. But when you look at the the hit on the employee because now the employee has to learn a new system again. So we can stay with Robin Health, who we've been happy with, um, or we can move to Wisconsin County. And in a lot of cases in the past, when we would get you know our numbers, quite often the numbers would be concerning. We would go out to bid, we would get some other options. There'd be three or four different, you know, reasonable, I'd say somewhat reasonable options. We would go out to our staff and brief them on everything. And then we would come back with, you know, the greatest level of staff feedback. I did not go through that process because at this point, I don't, I didn't see a reason to try to take up the time. This is a wonderful situation to be in. Um, to be able to go another year and, and maintain, and in this case, have it go down a little bit. I didn't see a reason to go back to our staff to say, hey, what do you think? Um, I don't have any reason to believe that they would have said, I think we should switch providers just because I want to learn a whole new bunch of paperwork with a different company. So 
So Hold. I'll make the motion to uh, continue with the recommendation for the dental and to continue with the Robin Health for the health. I'll second. Motion by Brian, second by Sarah. Come forward as presented. Any other questions? Debbie, this is going to affect when? January 1. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion oh, carried. Teacher handbook requirement. So this is an item that has been <clears throat> brought up multiple times over the years. Um, we have a three event requirement for certified staff. And this is something that it's my understanding, um, this was a budgetary action prior to 2015. And it has stayed around even though we've passed an operational referendum. We need people to work our events. And this is a, I don't, I don't know if contentious is the right word. There are, there's frustration that this causes amongst some of our certified staff. So we have some data up there for you that shows um, the number of staff and if they do their three events. So the idea is in the past up to this point, they're expected to do three events. It's part of an expectation for their employment. Um, if they don't do the three events, then essentially they pay $25 per event at the end of the year. Um, if they do more than three events, then they start earning compensation for the events. If, uh, if we are, we struggle to get all of our events covered, especially we talked in the spring, Chad, you mentioned, you know, how many people with the track meet? Well, think about how many people it, it probably takes 25 or 30 or more people to run that track meet, maybe 40. And Jerry and John, our athletic directors, are constantly trying to find folks. With that stated, um, in conversation with the administrative team, they don't feel that making this go away is going to automatically cause us to have an even harder time because they're saying that the few people that don't do their events now aren't probably going to start and the people who are are probably still going to do it the only difference is now they'll get paid versus it being part of their their three there's multiple sides to the issue Part of the reason that I haven't worked with the team to take action on this prior to now, philosophically, I really want the people to be involved outside of the classroom and making connections with our kids. We have a lot of folks that do that, and I really appreciate that. Um, but I also, Brian, I really appreciated it earlier. You grabbed some of that data and you said, hey, let's look at the data from our staff survey. This is an example, quite honestly, whether I agree with it or disagree with it is irrelevant. There's feedback from the staff survey that this irritates some of our staff members. They feel that this is an unreasonable expectation. They feel that it's time that it's just one more thing that they're expected to do outside of their normal responsibilities. So I haven't brought this to the step to the youth board. Um, I sat down with our administrative team. We looked at this and the administrators team came to consensus to bring this forward for your consideration. There is a fiscal cost to it. Um, I don't know if it's written on that document. Thank you. So 17.5 basically, if we eliminate this. Now, can we cover that in our budget? We can. Um, I will say that, you know, we are doing pieces and parts, you know, regularly. And the pieces and parts are things like this one, you know, 17.5 or 
20 or their 30. Um, so it's, it's being brought to you and I'm, I'm ready to answer your questions. I do see both sides of the equation and I'm trying to be thoughtful of the situation. So if you would cut it down to two events, would we still be covered? So I'm smiling because I, I'm trying to work on both sides. I, I know we we brought this up at nausea as a team. You know, do you phase it out? Do you do two next year, one the next year? And no matter what we do, my opinion, this is kind of an all or nothing scenario. Like either folks are going to feel like you know we've supported them and listened to them or not. Um, I don't know, maybe that's not a true statement, but that's that's my perspective on it. Um, I do feel that you're still going to have a need. I'm still gonna have an expectation. I mean, philosophically, I feel we, sh we should all be being involved in a lot of different activities. We saw a lot of people here. There's a bunch of staff members that worked really hard to make that parade happen on Sunday. A lot of staff members, a lot of parents, a lot of community members, a lot of people work together to pull that off. And there's a lot of people who have no idea how much those people worked to make that happen. They don't know how much time Brian's point tonight and Chad's point about how many hours coaches put in. A lot of folks don't necessarily know all the work that goes in behind the scenes, but it does. People who do know are usually very appreciative. This is kind of one more piece where I think that we still will have a lot of our staff members that will be doing this. The only difference is they'll be compensated rather than being just an expectation. And, you know, somebody either Ken or Jan mentioned earlier, you know, you want to try to make decisions that help people to fully understand how much you appreciate them. This kind of seems to right now, be doing the opposite. It, it seems to be sending a message to people. They don't feel appreciated. They feel a little bit more used. And I don't think the district ever intended that. At the time that this was implemented, the district was right up against it. The reason I know that is because when I joined the district, shortly after, we had to cut 600 and some thousand dollars. So there's a lot of cutting that happened before that. Okay. Do just a little history. Yeah, please. <laughs> the elder states person. <laughs> um, this came about, and I'm, I'm very certain of this, and uh, Belinda could help me with this too. It affected family members there. But um, back in 2011, when the state passed what became known as Act 10, and school districts had a lot less money to work with, just general numbers. Um, and there was also a question about um, unions in schools. Mr. Monahan was um, a leader with the uh, professional staff union side of the equation, and he worked tirelessly with uh, that particular part of the union and support staff also played ball literally with this, pun intended, but came to the board with a proposal of all the things that our staff were going to be willing to give up in order to help the district stay afloat and provide as much service to the students as possible. It was a huge amount of dollars that the group of employees came up with and literally put it on the table in the boardroom and said, we want to help. This is what we want to do to help. And part of that was to have staff members volunteer each for three extracurricular duties a year without pay. And that was part of that whole thing. And I think we've been able to do some things beyond that now. And I think that's just, you know, a legacy that's still there that if we can find 17.5 in the budget to take care of those after or those extracurricular needs, I think that whole requiring staff to volunteer, that needs to go away. I think we'll have people stepping up voluntarily take care of things when it's not up against the wall to do it so are we willing to if a high school kid wants to do it are we willing to pay them 
I, I guess we have to talk about that. We're talking now about staff members oh, right. who want to do that. But I don't know. It's that's a whole other question. It is open to any community well, members. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. I, Dean has already mentioned, and I agree that there's probably many of the staff members that are that are pitching in now will continue. Um, but I'm guessing too that, especially with the training that's being offered now for community members, there are community uh, people that uh, would be interested in uh, in helping out. And you know, we looked at the, some of the comments we saw that I saw tonight in there talk about you know lack of community involvement. That's one more way to get community people into the buildings and uh, in a, and working on the programs. That could be a positive thing too for fairly small investment. So I agree with you. It's got to it should go away. Mm -hmm. for, I mean, you talk to the administrative staff. I mean, my only concern is, do we end up with a situation where we don't, we aren't able to get uh, events covered? Um, but the, yeah, appro the approach here is to do it, to do a carrot instead of a stick. Mm -hmm. And it, it was maybe not a stick approach when it was originally put in place. It was meant as a, how can we all pull together and do something positive? So in the positive sense, I think moving, Moving away from the the way the language is, um, but just making sure that you know people know how much. I mean, those things are needed. I mean, the the culture of a school is around, you know, not just the academic classroom, but the extracurricular type items. Yeah. You know, of all different capacities, whether it be you know the arts or sports or whatever. I mean, that's what brings the community together. It, it's not it's not just the classroom aspect. So. You know, if this is something positive and can be viewed positive by the by the staff, that's great. Um, but it, the, the need certainly doesn't doesn't go in a way. And I hope, I think those that are always involved will still be involved. Those that weren't involved before won't be, and the ones that kind of did it because they kind of had to. Hopefully, they view it as you know what I'm willing to continue to to do and and be engaged, and maybe get some of them that aren't aren't doing it, you know, more willing to do so. It, it's. You know, and the kids, the kids notice which staff and community members and everyone's that's that's involved in you know, educating more than just outside in, inside the classroom. So. Well, in full transparency, we do struggle to get enough people to cover right now. So, hopefully, I mean, it may sound kind of contradictory, but we're we're hoping that in some way this might actually improve that. So, I guess we won't until we give it a try. So you start worst, that now worst comes or the worst next year. Worst comes the worst. We'll have to have board members volunteer. Right? Chad just brought up a good point. If you start it now or in the future, the intent would be to have it go active now. And anybody that's done some of their required already, we'd go back and we'd pay them proactive or retroactively. Mm -hmm. So if somebody already Since did July two, one. yep, we'd go back to July one. I'll just add one more thing. Go back to the data one more time. Right on there, it says the amount of work I, the amount of work I'm asked to do is reasonable, manageable. It was one of the lower ones, so you know maybe this will help free them up. But again, the carrot versus the stick, and I think that's just you know once you start compensating them, maybe they'll feel more value to it. So I'm I'm for it. I'd like to make a motion to uh, remove the language in the handbook requiring the. Uh, Teachers to work three events um, in retroactively paying what has done it thus far. Motion by Adam, second by Sarah. Any other discussion? Just correctly, retroactive to July 1. Correct. Okay, 2022. I agree with some of the comments earlier. I think the people that want to do it will still continue to do it um i don't think it a requirement to do it i don't think i mean if you don't want to do something and it's only 75 dollars a year i'm you're not gonna make them do it no matter what it's just a, an extra thing that they have to do and same with brian there were actual written comments specific to that that staff didn't want to do it so why make them people that want to do it will show up there's a way you can you know uh Further acknowledge those that take on multiple or you know the top. I mean, acknowledge people that are 
really taken advantage of this and do it. So. Uh, quick question. Sorry. Yep. Um, ahead. so would staff be getting paid what uh, a community me community member would get, be get paid? So same pay scale, right? Not twenty five bucks for them and for forty for someone else, right? Same scale. Same pay scale. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure we're on the same. Page. With that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Anybody? Gary. Anyone like to adjourn this marathon? I think we should stay here. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie sure the corporate food service that is out here for anybody wants to look at some nice pictures. <laughs> Breakfast time, night long. Yeah, that is. <laughs> I'll, adjourn. I'll, I'll motion to adjourn. Second. Brian, and was that Chad or Adam? Adam. Adam. We are adjourned. No, Chad's the official time. What's the time? 1055. Yeah, I got it. I just want to